OTB AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. Right, a very good morning to you this Monday morning. It's Jerno with you all the way through until 10. We have a very busy program and lots to get off our chest over the course of the next two and a half hours. We'd love to hear from you as well. 0879-180-180 is the WhatsApp number. Or, of course, you can always leave a comment on the YouTube stream. We pick them all up. Or you can tweet us at Off The Ball AM. That's the official Twitter handle for this show. How was your sports weekend? Get involved. Tell us. Uh, we'll give you an opportunity to win a Gillette starter pack in just a couple of minutes' time as well. But uh, as tournaments go, Owen, this is pretty good. Mm. It's. I'm trying to think of what 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 can he compare it to. I, I think I guess the last the last World Cup was quite good, and we've been quite lucky with recent tournaments. Maybe there's a bit of recency bias there, but uh, as far as European Championships go, this is right up there. Like I always look back at Euro 2004, despite the fact that Greece won it as like this very exciting thing. But I think that's very much firmly a nostalgia. The evidence that we've seen in front of our eyes over the last ten days or so suggests that this is a modern classic of a football tournament. Uh, I think that all of the pre-tournament prognostications about this being the death of football, <laughs> all that stuff has not just been true at all. And the weekend was some of the best things you're going to ever... Like, nothing made sense. That was the best part about the weekend, apart from England. Nothing really made sense. Nothing lived up to or down to or the pre-expectations, all the hype, none of it actually made sense, which was the perfect antidote to oh, the top teams are going to go through, which in the in a way has become... So the, the, the technical standard of the Champions League, admittedly, is far superior to what we're seeing right now. But the best teams always win, really. At the, particularly at this stage, in the group stages, there's never really anything that matters to the point like this stuff is mattering at the moment, where some teams have an opportunity or there's a, a window for a nation to pull together and do something remarkable. Yeah, I would say... Italy winning 1-0 says hello in terms of your nothing uh, unexpected happened or nothing expected happened at the weekend. But uh, everything else, by and large, what you're saying is, is, is right. Well, they, I mean, so in that match, that, that's not a bad example. The losing team puts in a heroic performance to go through on goal difference. Like, it, yeah, fair. You know, there was, there was something other than that main narrative and they didn't win 3-0, which they've obviously won every game so far. Yeah, no, and, and uh, like uh, it, it just felt kind of very Italian last night. Of the first two performances, didn't feel very Italian. And even just like the, the passion of the, the celebration, it seems that everybody's going full Marco Tardelli now whenever they score a goal, which I, it's just absolutely uh, fantastic. Like, I, I, when it comes to the, the technical quality, I do think that there have been glimpses from certain teams. Maybe not on the awesome technical level that we have seen from the likes of Paris Saint-Germain and Manchester City and obviously Chelsea at, at times over the last few months. But I do think that if there is any teams who bring some degree of technical quality allied with a really good tactical plan, they tend to be doing really well. And any of the top nations that, that have that uh, in their locker, like Italy is the perfect example, are, are flying. I, I think Germany are a really good example from the weekend where now I think there's a little bit of... Um, Yogi Love betting on black at the roulette table and being like, oh, well, that turned out pretty well for me because he almost screwed it up quite badly as well on, on Saturday night. But it just goes to show when you do have the players at your disposal and you sometimes manage to, to, to gather them in the correct way that will, that will beat your opponent, there, there are certain teams in this competition who, who, are, who can operate at a level above all opponents. But by and large, there's, there is a, a gap that can be closed between most of the teams in this in this tournament. Yeah, lots to love about this tournament so far. Uh, if there's stuff you haven't loved, then get in touch, 0879 180 180. I'll tell you that uh, OTBAM is brought to you by Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette. Give you the confidence to uh, put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. Sorry, good morning, start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. I want to tell you what's coming up between now and 10 o'clock this morning. We've got uh, our performance ranking coming right away. The uh, James Horncastle piece at five past eight is going to talk to you about the Italians, Roberto Mancini, the style of play, the massive unbeaten records. Uh, they've just they've just equaled their all-time unbeaten records. The previous time they did this was in the 1930s. Uh, so that'll tell you the level of uh, play that they're, they're getting at the moment. Andy Mitten's take on what's going on so far, the games that he's seen, and some Manchester United updates. We're talking Camogie with Sarah Dunneman at 8.45. And we've got reaction to John Ram being the uh, US Open champion. If ever there was something, somebody that was fated to win and deserved to win something, John Ram this week deserved to win that. We'll talk with Nathan around about 10 past nine. And then more from uh, 9.35. Uh, we'll talk to you 
uh, we'll bring you a little bit of the uh, Paddy and Andy football pod with Tommy, particularly where they're talking about controlling the game. It's brilliant, a brilliant analysis and some Mario Rosenstock goodness coming your way after half past nine this morning as well. Time for the performance rankings. You know, that wasn't an All-Ireland winning performance. Probably should have won the game based on the second half performance. Is it a step too far to say it was the performance so far of the World Cup? Maybe not. OTBAN's performance rankings with Gillette. I'm, I'm, I'm scratching my head. That performance is was just lack that intensity. Right, the performance rankings before we uh, get into Owen's... Uh, I mean, you haven't, you haven't been as, as bullish, bullishly confident about these as you have been about... Um, other rankings that you do most perfectly correct, but that's probably because... They are most perfect and correct. It's too hard to kind of compare this with that, isn't it? Well... Apples and oranges. It, it, look, uh, every Monday morning here on OTBM, we give you the chance to win a Gillette starter pack. All you've got to do is send in your suggestions to us. You can do them in the Instagram channel. You can uh, leave them on YouTube. You can tweet us at Off The Ball. Uh, you tell us who's red, who's amber, who's green, and you could win. We'll announce the winner before the end of the show. It's on YouTube or on our Instagram channel. Right, winner pick before half past nine. Who is red, amber and green this week, Owen? The good, the bad, the grand. We'll start with the bad. And first up there, as you can see, the first name on the sheet is England in the bad after their performance against Scotland on Friday. The, this general sense of everything is fine, uh, kind of invading the comments from the camp, invading the media. Even I, I think if, if you've been watching a lot of BBC and ITV over the past couple of days, that, that everything is definitely fine. And there was like a moment on Saturday night in... Uh, the BBC studio where Rio Ferdinand and Michael Richards were like, and, and Gary Lineker in fairness, it was, it was a three-man debate uh, kind of tossing up ideas about what actually went wrong for England on Friday night, kind of mulling over this national disgrace of drawing with a nation like Scotland and you'd Jurgen Klinsmann in the middle of all of them just, just laughing at them being like, you guys are going to be fine. But I'm not sure if, uh, if Jurgen Klinsmann is actually right on this occasion. I think that uh, the, the, the sense of worry that actually might be uh, that might have seeped in when that mask slipped on Saturday night a little bit when these three lads started to actually debate what had gone wrong rather than being like, look, listen, four points, happy days. I think that actually might be kind of closer to the truth that there is a sense in this England camp right now that they just have not shown up to this tournament with the level of performance that they've gotten at times in qualification and even in the Nations League. And this very hard to nail down thing about why England can't show up at, at major tournaments is coming right back to the fore again when they seem to have done a lot of things quite right in the build-up. And quite right in the tournament so far. Why, why, why are they suddenly being absolutely... So many people waiting in the long grass to kill England, right? I, I think that... How much of your analysis is you just absolutely loving the fact that they draw with the country they own? No, how, much, how much of it is down to like... Not at ah, all. Nah, nah, nah. Not at all. You, you see, you made, you made this argument last week as well that it was some like post-colonial <laughs> argument. When actually, no. Uh, if you look at a team that are second favourites... Can you, un can you favorites. unbake the inferiority complex? Just take those ingredients out and then give me your, your raw, subjective... I, for, Objective for, for people, people who are familiar with the show, I was I was born in London. I used to have an English accent myself. I am the biggest tan going. Uh, let's uh, let's put that out there this morning. Okay, uh, now so, we're getting somewhere. Come on. So this Take is it out. this, this is Come purely on. on a footballing level. So so you actually think that this is going well for England? You thought that they were really great against Scotland. Croatia. We're good. You Scotland, were, we're good. That's the problem. Like Scotland have a load of really good players who played really well in that game. Showed up for like this biggest game of their lives. Look at, look at the difference in performance from Scotland's first game to their second game, right? And check, check and see what the difference between the performance that they, they were able to put in. You, and then you put that against England, who have to hold that off. And if John Stones isn't John Stones and sticks that header in like every other centre-back in world football would have done with a free header from two yards out, okay, six yards out, whatever it was, right? But essentially, it was like the easiest header you're ever going to have in his career. If he doesn't just clatter it off, the, the angle of upright and crossbar, then I think England are going to win that game pretty easy. Because I think that that's, you, I think they're giving a sucker an even break. And at that point, you can see Scotland going, right, we've got our break, here we go. And so I think this is just a game in a tournament that when we, when we look back on it, I think England are, I think England are, I, a couple of things, right? Jack Grealish comes off the bench. Jack Grealish has to start the next game. Over the course of these three games, he's accidentally going to find his best and most aggressive uh, starting eleven, and I, I think that there's a there's, there has to be some kind of come to Jesus moment for Gareth Southgate where he's like, maybe being a defensively sound and very boring team isn't the best way to win the tournament because actually our players are a little bit behind where the French team are, or where the Portugal team was uh, four years ago, five years ago. 
and our best bet is to be England as opposed to some kind of weird simulacrum with these other teams. And also he changed the fullbacks. I don't know why he changed the fullbacks. That was just listening to listening to the public. He was like, oh, I'm going to play all my fullbacks because I brought them all and I have to justify myself. So I think that like, this That's is really strange. They played really well. You're, Scotland played really well. You're, you're really... Like, this, I think what's actually notable here is the effort to which you're going to defend. The, you're, you're finding things, finding ways to defend this England performance rather than actually analysing what you've seen. Like this, I mean, er, er, nobody at home needs me to deconstruct your argument there. If England had taken a 1-0 lead, it would have been a different game. That's how football works. You don't score your goals. You don't execute your opportunities. And of course, you're not going to win games. So like we can, li we can live in the fancy full if you want. No, like, no, no, I'm no, going to believe that Kevin Caban scored that rebound and we got to a quarter final in 2002. Oh, like, poor Kevin Caban yeah, sitting in the corner of the studio suddenly <laughs> bodied by you out of, out of nowhere, I, Owen. Like, okay, fair enough. Okay. I, I'm going to believe that, um, like that, d d that uh, Lee Keegan's GPS hit, hit Lee Keegan, uh, uh, Dean Rock's football that time, and Dublin don't do four in a row. Like We can absolutely okay. Things okay, if you okay, want to do okay. that this my, my point is that England are still, they're still a bit fragile. They are definitely a bit mentally weak at the moment. But I'm not saying that an ill-all draw against, in a derby game, against yeah. a very talented side, uh, like Scotland completely written off here, like loads of really good players in that team. Tierney was sensational. Robertson was sensational. McGinn played as well as he can play. And uh, like, there's, there's no reason for England to brush that team aside. There just isn't, and particularly in international football. And OK, England definitely have problems, but uh, not the amount of problems that your inferiority complex is suggesting here. Uh, yeah, but you see, they, but, uh, what, like, what is the expectation for this England team? I would have thought that as second... Semi-finals. Like, they've got to, they're yeah. going to have to beat a good team. I'd be, see, there you go. I would be concerned about that. So I think, therefore, it looks... The evidence we have suggests that they are going to fall short of the expectation, and that's why they're in the bad. Like, it's nothing to do with me, oh, I, I hate England, or uh, th this is a, a team to bash. It's, they are one of the pre-tournament favourites, and they have underperformed as much as any of the other pre-tournament favourites. The only other kind of, like, big nation that you could say has been as disappointing, really, has been Spain. And Spain didn't have even the, the pre-tournament expectation that England had. Spain are a team for the future, England are a team for the now. And the now ain't looking too pretty as an England fan. Like, you, you, like you, you've got Gareth Southgate coming out yesterday, essentially telling the press that Harry Kane is starting tomorrow night to shut the press up about speculating about whether or not Harry Kane's going to start tomorrow night. You've got Raheem Sterling coming out saying everything is fine in the camp and in fairness, Raheem Sterling is, is put out and he's just the man in the firing line, but like he says stuff like Scotland was a different type of test and I felt we got drawn into their style of play. The sort of excuse that like, I mean, we, these cavemen came along and uh, brought us down to their level. Like uh, it was back to front, back to front. It is not very often you'll get that at the international level. Like the bang of Thomas Delaney describing Ireland as opening a tin of beans with your bare hands about those Raheem Sterling comments. Again, any other English player probably would have said the exact same thing, but it's indicative of what they're saying to each other in the camp, I feel. And this just doesn't, this does not say to me that this is a, a winning environment or a team that is about to become a winning environment. Maybe I'll be wrong. Their players are absolutely good enough to go and win this thing. But what we've seen from the first two games, first of all, a very mediocre performance against a terrible team, like a really terrible, not a terrible team, but a terrible performance from Croatia. And then against an OK Scotland side, they were poor. And that, that's, that's what we're judging it on now. And um, sure, we can get into the idea of uh, the, what sort of happiness levels we're getting from, uh, from seeing England underperform. What kind of but happiness I'm levels? I'm dealing in facts here. What kind of happiness levels are you getting as a matter of just from watching? Do you know what? Actually, not a, a whole pile. Like, I do think that this bunch of England players, and like we've had this conversation a lot of times over the last three years, I think, I think since Southgate and, and Russia in 2018, this is genuinely a, a likeable uh, bunch of players. So, so it is hard to, to have the classic sort of begrudgery around them. And I do think that the classic begrudgery, certainly from my perspective, always came down to the fact that there was this, uh, this cocksure swagger about them going into every tournament. Uh, and you just kind of wanted to see them brought down a peg or two, whereas this England team are quite humble, it seems, and uh, you don't really have that same sense of joy when they don't do well. It would be nicer if they were maybe a, a little, uh, may maybe worse people or something like that, then we could perhaps get, all get behind Scotland. You can always, uh, you can always find people in the media who are um, against them or for them who you can inspire that level of schadenfreude for you if you want. But uh, look, I don't know, I just think that a lot of the analysis is definitely coloured by <laughs> like, I actually think that it's hard to take a game like the Scotland game 
in isolation, and I thought that they they won the Croatia game. Like, uh, so they they won one. They played against a, a deep, bitter rival, and they are unbeaten, and they have yet to concede a goal. Yeah, the not conceding a goal thing is definitely a positive. Uh, like, I, 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 and maybe if they get into a last sixteen against. I, I, I would like it's hard to know which of those teams would be the, the best matchup for them at the moment. I just think that England, if they get into a situation where the opponent are dominating possession, we actually might see a much better England version. We might actually see Harry Kane as the spearhead of a counter attacking team, for example, and all of a sudden they're scoring two or three goals in a game and, and away they go. Maybe this is just a bad scenario for them to be in where they, where they are dominating possession and they've got to come up with the ideas. Maybe they're a little bit better if they're. Um, if they're submitting a little bit more to, to the opponent and like as we're seeing in the group of death there have been just like a couple of really interesting uh, I guess outcomes uh, w w when the, the game is actually played out tactically and maybe England would just be a little bit better not having to take the game to the opponent but then again they're at home for the whole thing about a quarter final so maybe it will be up to them to, to take the game to the opponent in every situation yeah um, uh, is there uh, no they've, they've caved on all the final demands to UEFA as well so the final is definitely going to be in England if they qualify um, is there anything else? Is there anything about Harry Maguire? Is there anything about Bellingham? Like, could the team be recast at this point, or is it too late? As uh, maybe a, a three at the back? Like, we could, could we potentially would that be the problem? Answering their problems, or would that well, be like doubling down on the? <laughs> <laughs> hey, look. Maybe actually, yeah. Uh, like, I mean, you asked me for solutions to, to the thing. Like, it, it is just like it does seem to me that the three at the back was thrown out with Harry Maguire's injury pre-tournament that before the tournament everybody was like well it's, it's obviously going to be three at the back and maybe Trent Alexander-Arnold's injury impacts that somewhat as well uh, but like I mean you would kind of like to see Rhys James and and um, or is, no you're not uh, Kyle Walker and Kieran Trippier or Rhys James on the same side of a, of a defence for example maybe uh, like either Luke Shaw or Chilwell as a, as a more advanced left wing back at that moment and uh, maybe you don't necessarily need a three in the midfield you can you can have the, the, the two holding midfielders at that point or even have Mason Mount and one of Calvin Phillips or or Declan Rice and that might solve a few problems I don't know it, 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 like I'm not convinced by my own argument here but maybe Harry Maguire comes back in and uh, is like it's just the totemic leader that they need and maybe it, and maybe it's his big giant forehead at the end of that yeah. uh, chance that goes to Stones and he scores that because he's not John Stones um, I look I, I realize Stones had a great season but Stones had a great season playing in a completely different team and I'd have him out of my side at this stage. And anyway, I'm always interested, what, what would the England team, the Pep Guardiola, would pick with this group of players at the moment? And how would they play football? What would the difference be? I think that... they picked Sancho, probably. Well, yeah, and you can see that maybe, maybe he wouldn't, I don't know. I'd be very interested to see if they're genuinely in the market for an out-and-out -out striker, the way everybody says they are at the moment, or if actually Pep has decided that football is best played where you've got five or six players over the course of a season who are going to score 10 to 15 goals for you and in the England side and in the international team what would that look like can you fit Grealish and Foden into the same team and both of them playing in something uh, close to their preferred uh, position and what all of a sudden does that unleash this incredible waves of creativity and you know you're, you can't plan for them as the opposition so mm. I don't know an interesting thought experiment what did you make of uh, Jack Grealish and the, the Stephen O'Donnell thing? Your your beloved Jack Grealish getting uh, uh, getting sledged in the most beautiful way by his whispered, opponent. Whispered sweet nothings. Um, for anybody who didn't see this, Stephen O'Donnell, I mean, it's going to be an interesting training session when they go back the first time. Uh, McGinn told him what to do. He told him that you, you can get in his head by uh, complimenting him, not by giving him crap. So he was like, oh, you beautiful calves. Such big, beautiful calves. You're so talented. Wow, look at the size of your calves. They're amazing. <laughs> and, and you don't even shave them. It was like, <laughs> weird, 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 very particular detail. Uh, but brilliant, obviously, genius. How do you get your hair to look like that? Uh, it's, yeah, it's like, a, I mean, it's, <laughs> if you're hearing that, you're a little bit put out. You're like, it's, it's worse than, uh, I think for every player, I don't think it'll be just Jack Reed. I think for every player, it's kind of worse to hear that from an opponent than to hear uh, your crap mate, because that just fires up most footballers, I'd imagine. Uh, but he was just getting sick of it at that stage. He was sick of running back Stephen O'Donnell, he said. And yeah, John McGinn uh, uh, so sold his mate out and, uh, and, and found out how to get at uh, Jack Grealish. So there is your problem. Scotland are just really good at trash talking, as it turns out. There's number five, England. Uh, we can fly through some of the rest of these. Yeah. Uh, we've got a bit of time. So we've still got another 10 minutes. If anybody has anything they want to get off their chest right now, 
about your schadenfreude or your, your love of this English team, we'd love to hear from you. 0879 is the WhatsApp number, or better still, you can leave a comment for us on the YouTube stream. Who else is in the red? We're still in the red. Still in the red. I'm just going to stick France in here uh, pretty quickly and uh, move on. This is, again, quite... Uh, I think this is probably just... A bit, it would probably come back to bite us a little bit more than England possibly putting France in here. This is just based on the, the draw against Hungary. I know it's you're going into a cauldron uh, in Budapest. But, like, if, if we want to be... Uh, if we want to revise history here completely and uh, alter the entire thing, you could look back at that France-Germany game now and say to yourself, was there a little bit of an issue in how France didn't actually kill off that game? Granted, there was two very marginal offside calls and France maybe could win that game 3-0 on a different day. But the way in which they were going about going for the kill was very reactionary and it was based on a counter-attack. And now, in fairness, if you've got Kalina Bappe in your team, why wouldn't you try and counter-attack as much as possible and uh, sort of venture into those open spaces with his ridiculous pace? But I just wonder, is is that actually something to be concerned about? That there wasn't, after they went 1-0 up, that, that there, was, there wasn't a whole pile of... OK, let's control possession here a little bit more. Let's, let's go through the phases here and, and let's break this team down. It was very much OK that Germany have the ball and, and let's hit them on the break. Um, maybe that's perfect. Maybe that's exactly what you should be doing in, the, in a 1-0 situation. But I just wonder after what we've seen on Saturday, are, they, are there actually more holes to, to Deschamps' side than, than maybe met the eye against Germany? I don't know. I can't tell. Like it didn't, it, this was the point I was making at the start of the show. A lot of this just didn't make any sense. Yeah. Right? A lot of this just seemed to be... Some, somehow, international football has taken on the ability to not pay attention to the talent of the two teams, the form of the two teams up to this point, all of the context around the game, and suddenly for the games to be, in and of themselves, a single entity. I've never seen this before, where you're like, I know this is going to be a routine 3-0 win, because that's what all of history tells you, and then all of a sudden, it's not. Is it the, sta is it the people in the stands? Is, that, is it this kind of, like superpower of having fans and I don't know what 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 do you think yeah no I think that comes into it I do think there was a little bit of a bit of Liverpool the season just gone about France at, uh, on Saturday where they had far more shots than Hungary but ended up having a similar number of shots on target as Hungary that the quality of their uh, shot making and, and decision making was poor and I think that's something that probably let Liverpool down quite a bit and there was this massive drop off as a result of, of one very important statistic. And like maybe you just get panicked in that sort of environment as well, where players maybe aren't used to this really intimidating atmosphere because they just haven't played in, the, in that sort of place for, for quite some time. Or maybe this is just the second game of the tournament, that they've got the three points against Germany and they know that Hungary are next up, lads. Uh, as long as we just don't get beaten here, we're, we're going to be going through to the next round more than likely. So that, that, that is probably the more realistic uh, expectation here that, that France will come back to, to the level they were at maybe at, at times in that Germany game once they go up against Portugal the next day uh, but I th I just maybe think that again like maybe this tournament is just completely wild and there won't be a, a dominant team who will be perfect going all the way through unless Italy win all their games and, and maybe Belgium as well uh, it, it just seems that if France are to be this uh, th th this I, I don't know, this flawless team that we, could, we, we couldn't pick a, a, any setback in pre-tournament, then I think a one-all draw with Hungary is a result that would make you reconsider that pretty swiftly because this Hungary team aren't amazing. They've got this brilliant advantage in having a full stadium, but that's about as far as it goes. Let's move on because if ever there was a ranking in any of these rankings that we've ever done that betrayed you, Owen, that revealed your true character. It's this one. So, uh, England who drew and France who drew are in the red, yeah. which means bad. Yeah. Portugal are in the grand. Yeah. Portugal got annihilated 4-2. Portugal got annihilated 4-2 and uh, almost kind of uh, came right back into the game. Yeah, you're, you're pointing out the folly of my ways here as if, uh, as if these are actually some sort of flawed rankings. How, how could you do that to me on a, on a Monday morning? I think that... First of all, the quality of opposition here needs to come into play. England were playing Scotland, France were playing Hungary, Portugal were playing Germany. and Sound a bit like Raheem Sterling there, Ron, but go on. Well, I mean, the Germany, I don't know, I, I'd said 
pre-tournament that they might do something in that first game against France. If that France game was a game to watch, just watch out, don't write off these Germans just yet. And it didn't happen, and I was a little bit disappointed. I was like, okay, well, that was um, one of many, many bad takes. But in actual fact, what I should have just said was, watch out for Germany in this group, and they will do something in this group. And as it turned out, they did do something uh, in this group, and they were phenomenal on uh, Saturday in so many different ways. But one of the major reasons why they were phenomenal in, in so many different ways was that Portugal just didn't really seem to realise what was going on. And Santos, I don't know, like, was he just looking at one side of the pitch or had he just like looked at Robin Gozens and said to himself, well, that, that guy is um, that guy is not somebody who's registered in our radar too much. He's managed to pop up on the left-hand side of the pitch, the back post, and uh, that's fine. That's not going to happen too many more times in this match. And then it kept on happening and kept on happening. And Germany kept on getting in in very repetitive ways. Now, in fairness, it looked as if Portugal were going to do the exact same thing, and it seemed that every goal that was scored in that game was somebody arriving late at the far post to, to tap in. Um, and I just feel that the way they got hammered at the weekend was it's such a fixable, it's such a fixable thing. Maybe you blame the manager, maybe the manager doesn't have it in him to, to, to fi find his way out of those situations. But I think if you're looking at a team who have quality to go and win this thing, I would still absolutely have Portugal in that position. And I still think that there were just a multitude of different factors at play at the, at the weekend in that crazy game that ensured that they lost. Like, like Maybe it's because they've proven it at the very last Euros, but this is a team that can come back from a 4-2 defeat and absolutely be in the business end come the, come the end of the tournament. And uh, a moment for Cristiano Ronaldo for the opening goal. Like, I, he, he didn't think he was onside. There was definitely a... It looked like there was a conflict with everybody. Just pretend... Let's keep going with this, um, but I, you know, look, they gave it, and I'm sure that you could have found a VAR armpit to disallow it if you wanted to. But in the meantime, th as soon as he headers the ball from the corner, he knows his goal on. Like it's, and the sprint is so spectacular. Yeah, I thought it was, like, because the the elasticity is supposed to be gone from the jump in the in the first game there was a header that he couldn't quite reach the way we know he would have reached when he was 26 or 19. But uh, that goal was like, wow. Yeah, it, it was stunning. And like even it felt at that point that you that there was just this uh, great arrival even from Jota in this tournament. I know he like scores later in the game, but for me it was that moment where he just like squares the ball for Ronaldo because in the previous game against Hungary, he obviously had that opportunity and he takes it himself. And Ronaldo eats him out of it and like that's just like uh, th this moment where you're like Jota what, what's the, the correct thing to do in this situation and maybe he got a shot and maybe that was the right thing to do against Hungary but uh, he learned his lesson and he came back a few days later and was like alright my job as a teammate of Cristiano Ronaldo's is to pass the ball to Cristiano Ronaldo and he did that on, on Saturday and he thought right okay Portugal have figured this thing out now the problem is that they conceded four goals uh, <laughs> which uh, it would certainly uh, le leads uh, is a bit of a drawback when you get a little bit excited by Jota squaring the ball for Ronaldo yeah. earlier yeah, on. Like, but I like, just figure out the fact that they've got wing backs who are going to kill you. And if you play that game again in the morning, uh, maybe if they realise that wing backs exist and Kimmich is good at football as well as Gozens, then uh, then maybe maybe this thing goes differently. I just think that there is a there is a paper thin difference between uh, what looks like a really poor result for Portugal and what they could have come out of that game at, which might have been actually a positive result. OK, so they're in the grand. In the good, we have Italy and Germany. Yeah. Uh, so we will start with Italy. Italy have just been sensational this tournament. Uh, I, I'm sure a lot of people have them as, as tournament favourites at this point. I think that when it comes to the Portugal conversation we just had, I do think that there is uh, real credence in saying that Italy just haven't been properly tested yet. And, and that's nothing to do with Italy. It's to do with Portugal and it's to do with the fact that they've properly being put up against it by, by Germany and even on like a tactical level to see what they will be up against in the knockout stages. Italy possibly haven't seen that yet, but it doesn't change the fact that they've been awesome and like I mean they say time is undefeated, but I'm not sure if time has ever come up against Leonardo Bonucci. Uh, I know Chiellini is out at the moment, but I would say that he probably goes uh, along the same lines. Like I, I, I don't think David Myler will be singing on the final day of the tournament. I think Italy may win this, this tournament, but unfortunately our, our buddy Chiro Immobile might let us down. We really needed him to, to play and score last night <laughs> for yeah. the, the golden boot. You need, you need somebody to bully an opposition on the final day of a group uh, stage. And the big step forward for Italy is that they played a second string team and didn't get stung by a Robbie Brady-esque header this time. So they've come so far in just five years. Uh, and Germany. Germany, well, yeah, this, this comes back to uh, what we were saying earlier on, that like 
Germany or Germany. They have a collection of players that are good enough to beat a lot of uh, teams around Europe. And maybe there was this massive overreaction last year to a game played in a vacuous stadium in a tournament that maybe not a lot of people care about, which was that 6-0 that hammering against Spain. Maybe even reading into that could have been a, a sensible thing on, on the other hand because you think to yourself, right, well, they've got a number of months to get this thing back on track. It did seem after the first game that you're looking at maybe like Hummels and Muller, even though they were pretty good, and you're like, are, are these guys the answer? Are, are, are these guys coming back actually? Is bringing them back a good idea when Love initially thought that they weren't good enough to play international football anymore? These are the sort of reactive questions you ask yourself when you lose the first game of the tournament. And then after Saturday, the whole thing flips on its head and it's like Matt Summers and Thomas Muller, absolutely the correct call to bring them back because they are absolutely quality and they have at one period or another been some of the best players in Europe in their position. And okay. it all clicked lovely for, for them on Saturday. We'll, we'll do more Germany talk a little bit later on this week. We'll do more Italian talk with James Horncastle in a moment. Uh, some obviously this was a Euro special. We, we should have said that at the very start. We're going to do Euro specials performance rankings for the duration of the tournament, which meant that there was no room for loads of other big people, big stories from the uh, weekend. John Ram would have been in the green. Obviously, we'll talk about that with Nathan a little bit later on. Leona Maguire, uh, bogey-free final round to finish second in America. This is her best uh, finish on the PGA Tour so far. She should definitely have been in this and would have been if we had been doing this normally, right? Yeah. $214,000 was her payday from the weekend in, in Michigan. 13th now in the LPGA Order of Merit. And like you don't want to attempt fate, but it looks like we're going to have uh, an Irish player in the Solan Cup this year. And a, a future major winner right there. Uh, would Roy McElroy have been in the red or the amber? In the amber? Like he, yeah. he, he competed. He, he's certainly making confident noises saying that he got something from this week for the first time in a long time. Yeah, it definitely in the grand. I think that actually talking about a major Sunday and being really looking forward to a major Sunday with McElroy involved felt odd and unusual in a brilliant way yesterday. Now, I think it was just this great prelude to what could have been a, a phenomenal finish yesterday, but obviously on the 11th to 12th hole uh, for Rory, for Bryson, uh, things just went uh, a little bit south for them. Well, a lot south for them. The Ireland Sevens team qualified for the Olympic Games. Yeah, the most photogenic team in sport. I'm not sure is it selfies they were taking on the back of the newspapers this morning where a, a photographer was there, but uh, they, they're certainly uh, looking happy and like this incredible comeback as well in that win against France yesterday. 28-19 uh, was the, the final score. They were 12-7 uh, down. I was, uh, was going to make it. This is the first time that they've been relevant since Greg O'Shea. But he's, hey, back, he's back playing for them. He's back, back playing for them, yeah. He's, he's given up the... Uh, Celebrity lifestyle. The, the Love Island lifestyle, yeah, to, to go and play... Uh, play uh, Sevens Rugby and like if people haven't seen the Billy Dardis interview uh, at full time go and check that out on social media it's absolutely brilliant just talking about the, the turnover of players obviously the Sevens has been this it's actually one of the success stories in a 15 sense when you think about like Robert Balakun and Hugo Keenan but if you're a Sevens player that's not a success story at all you're like you're taking all our best players and all yeah. our best players are constantly lo are, are leaving so you kind of need to strike while the iron is hot a little bit um, get players back from the, the influencer game maybe and uh, they've managed to, to maintain a level that's going to take them all the way to the Olympics so uh, they're in the top 12 teams in the world. Well at least they'll be uh, ready for all the fame that is coming their way when they win gold. Three minutes past eight this morning here on OTBM. Very busy show for you to come. That is your performance rankings this week. OTBAN's performance rankings with Gillette. Okay, we've got Andy Mitten coming up before half past eight. Camogie with Sarah Donovan and golf with Nathan a little bit later on. We're back talking Italy with James Horncastle next. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. The Football Pod with Paddy and Andy, our new weekly Gaelic football show with Paddy Andrews and Andy Moran. Everyone knows the A's and B games. You were surely always on the A team, were you? Uh, for a very <laughs> too brief a period. But at the end of my career, I was on the B team. Right? You go out and you play a 20 minute or 30 minute match or whatever it is. Ball is thrown in in this training game, and we're ready to run through brick walls and say, Fed to win the kicker. Dublin, the A team just keep the ball for four minutes, four or five minutes, just to piss us off. Download the OTB Sports app and subscribe to the GAA podcast feed now. Why not check out the Boyle Sports betting app for a full range of markets on shots on target, assists, passes and more on every match of the Euros, all powered by Opta. Rated four and a half stars on the App Store, you'll find all our latest odds and offers for the Euros. So remind us where to go, CBG. Boyle Sports, this is betting. 18 plus bet responsibly, gamblingcare.ie. Invisible Threads, a Go Loud original. Go 
As we celebrate the sixth anniversary of marriage equality, Invisible Threads meets older members of the LGBTQ community who reflect on their journeys and tell their stories. From shame and isolation to conversion therapy, from living with fear to coming out as an older person, Join me, James O'Hagan, for this powerful eight-part series, winner of the first Go Loud podship. Subscribe to this podcast for free on the Go Loud app. Sean, what's that thing going round the garden? That is my, uh, our new Husqvarna automower. Automower? Yeah, it's a robotic lawnmower from Husqvarna. Cuts the grass automatically, has GPS tracking and an app. Even works in the rain. Hmm. I just thought, why spend time cutting grass when I could spend it with the family? You can put the dinner on, so. Ah, no can do, love. I have to paint the man cave. Husqvarna Automower. Never mow again. Learn more at husqvarna.ie. OTB AM. With Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. Six minutes past eight this morning here on OTBAM, the sports breakfast show from Off the Ball. You're very welcome along if you've just joined us. We have a brilliant show lined up for you and loads more to get our teeth stuck into. Nathan's going to talk to us about John Ram after nine o'clock and we'll look back on the weekend's camogie as well. But we're going to uh, talk about the Italian performance right now. I'm delighted to say James Horncastle is with us. James, good morning to you. How are you? Very good, guys. How are you? Yeah, so, well, pretty excited by the quality of football we're watching from this Italian side. Uh, even their second string team are devastating and and seem to be very much playing as a unit. It's uh, remarkable stuff we've seen from them so far. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that Mancini has been saying is that, you know, I don't have 11 first-team players. I've got 26. And you, know, you mentioned the eight changes that he made for the, the starting lineup against Wales. Um, well, by the end of the game, with all the substitutions he'd, he'd made, he'd, he'd actually used 25 of the 26 guys, even his reserve goalkeeper, which I think if you were Welsh and you saw Salvatore Sirigu coming on for Chicha Donnarumma in the final five or ten minutes, you were wondering what you were participating in. And Look, I mean, they were already qualified, but um, if they if the result didn't go their way they, yesterday, Wales had the chance to win the group. They they got the job done. I think what was really encouraging, and you know, when speaking to people on Mancini's staff before the, before the tournament, they were worried that Marco Verratti... Uh, uh, was going to be a big miss for the first few games of the season uh, for the, the tournament. It turned out that Manuel Locatelli uh, more than uh, deputised for him in those first two games. But when Benassi came back uh, for, for the Wales game, you know, it was like he'd never been away. And uh, I think, again, that just builds confidence for, for the team. And, and, you know, while the knock on them so far is OK in this 31-game on beaten run, who have they played? You know, the Netherlands, Portugal, Poland all of whom I think are really good teams. Um, you know, they're really confident that with this style of football, with this team spirit, they can go all the way. It does seem, obviously, this is like some sort of, um, I guess, uh, goodbye between Italian fans and the Italian team as they go on their travels now and, and, and try and win this thing out. And there was this unbelievable reception, by all accounts, when, when, when Mancini's name gets read out and when, when Mancini comes up on screen and when anything Roberto Mancini uh, appears in this Italian scenario. J just how loved by Italian fans is this man right now? Well, you've got to remember the circumstances in which he got the job, um, which was 2018, one of the lowest moments in, in Italian football history. First time I've missed out on qualifying for the World Cup in, 26, uh, in 60 years. Um, yeah, they uh, were humiliated, really. Uh, and he, he came in. I think he needed them as much as uh, they needed him as well because, you know, really after uh, doing such a great job at City, um, you know, he's drifted, really, from Galatasaray to St. Petersburg. And, you know, he's, he's, instead of downplaying the national team, which some of his predecessors have done, he's really talked them up. He said, look, we've won the World Cup four times. We've been to the European Championship final. You know, we're a great football nation. Let's get back to doing that. And I think the style of football with which, you know, I mean, he's really built his team around Jorginho, Verratti, and Barella, and Insigne, players that were available to uh, his predecessors, quality players with skill, but who, yeah, didn't really fit into other people's systems. And he's built the team around them. He said, look, I'm not going to impose my system on you. I want to, I want to get as much quality in this team as possible. And they played a style of football which has made, you know, Italians stand up and, and be entertained. And uh, I think that, combined with you know, what we've all been through in the last 18 months, but, you know, I mean, Italy was really, I think, the first European epicenter of the, the pandemic. I think there's this desire to just 
see, uh, well, watching it and communing something together. Uh, and Mancini's bringing along the entire nation. He's really talking the, the, the team up as being in a sort of an agency of positivity. Um, and it, it's, it's working. It's working. I mean, it's, it's, it, even if you're not Italian, it's hard not to watch this thing uh, and have a smile kind of grow across your face. So that's kind of it then, really. Like the, 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 the sense that maybe that Italy were being held back, that the happiness was being bottled up over the last few years, even, even pre-pandemic. Was there that sense, James? Well, I think the other thing is, is Italy usually go into major tournaments um, uh, with, in a really tense atmosphere, um, either because that's just how they train. You know, they cloister themselves away and, and they have like a monastic kind of preparation. I mean, that was the criticism of... Fabio Capello, when he was in charge of England in South Africa, you remember that the, the training camp that they had in, in Rustenburg in the middle of nowhere. And instead, you know, Mancini has, has wanted everyone to have fun, you know, train with music on, uh, play lots of games. I mean, there's this crazy kind of variety show that they had on, on Rye, the state broadcaster, to announce the squad, which, you know, had, you know, Mancini and, and Daniel De Rossi, his assistant, playing uh, sort of paddle, which is, you know, sort of table tennis with a pair of frying pans. I mean, just, just all kinds of crazy things to keep morale going. And, uh, and you can see that the, the, the positivity within the group, the fact that this... I think the other interesting thing is that you've got two Juventus players who are starting, Chiellini and Bonucci, but one inter player in, in, in Nicola Borrello in midfield. And you've got Donna Roma, who's now going to Paris Saint-Germain. The rest of the squad is, is, is guys who you know, really kind of play together coming up from the under-15s at Italy level, you know, who, who maybe play together at, at, on loan at smaller clubs like Pescada in Insigne, Berati and uh, uh, Immobile's case. The other guys who, who play together for Sassuolo, Berardi and uh, Locatelli, they all know each other inside out. They're mates. They're not rivals. And I, I think that, uh, that really makes the difference uh, along with the kind of style that they've been trusted to play. Can I ask a little bit more about Mancini? The, the, I, I'm, maybe I'm mistaken, but as far as I know, he was like a teenage sensation, so has, has largely been in the public eye and had a, a sense of responsibility from the time that he was 17 or 18. And is, is, this, uh, is this current relationship that he has with the Italian public one of those relationships that comes about by virtue of the fact that you reach a certain point in in maturity where everybody realizes that actually this guy's really special and we should have loved him a bit more over the years we should have given him the same kind of currency as we would have given the great team of Viali and Baggio even though Mancini was around at that time was part of that trinity but never actually had the same glory as them I think that's a really interesting point um, because you know I mean he was uh, he was a prodigy uh, you know when he, he came on the scene in the 80s made his debut when he was 17 that was unheard of, really, um, at the time. Remember, it, you know, Italian football is, is quite famous for, for only trusting young players very late. You're young until you're about 27 uh, in Italy. Um, and you know, he was as talented um, as Baggio. I mean, you look at where Mancini won. He won at Sampdoria, who'd never won anything before. He won at Lazio, who hadn't won anything since the 70s. Even as a coach, he won things at Inter, who hadn't won anything for 18 years, at City for more than 40 years. You know, he is he is a winner, but I think you know when you talk about you know, appreciation for him, not so much as a, as a player, but as, as, as someone a Hall of Famer, let's say in the, in the history of Italian football, because he had this kind of irascible uh, uh, kind of attitude where he would really flare up quite easily if you didn't if you didn't play him, if you left him out, if, if, if he wasn't in the team, which was certainly the case with the national team. We did it. A long read on the athletic about his kind of troubled relationship as a player where you know i mean he only played um at euro 88 he was a squad uh, he was a squad player at italian 90 never got a minute and this is his second chance really um to get the kind of glory that he had with his club side with the national side which eluded him um as a player and you know i, I think that experience the fact that he never got off the bench at italian 90 he never got to play in front of uh, the nazi magic at the olympic I think that's one of the reasons why you saw him make all those substitutions, all those changes uh, against Wales. He wanted the, the guys in that squad to get the experience that he didn't have. And I, I think that second chance um, he's got and, and the willingness he's given to give opportunities to, to the players he's called up just really kind of, again, plays into the, the enthusiasm, the excitement and the, and the good vibe around the national team. 
would Mancini, the player, have had a better chance of succeeding in the Mancini, the manager's team, than the team of Italia 90, for example? Yeah, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he would definitely be the most talented player on the pitch. I mean, that, again, that just goes to show uh, how talented that generation he was a part of. Uh, was uh, in the 80s and 90s. And, you know, it, it's one of the things that has played into why his predecessor, the town, played. Um, the national team, I mean, he's got a bit of a, a, a new generation coming through. But he doesn't have the kind of number 10 that you used to expect of, uh, of Italy or the great striker um, that you, you, you had of Italy. Um, but, you know, I think he would have enjoyed it. I mean, it, it's curious. I mean, you know, in the, in the uh, from 92 to... In 96, I mean, he, he, he did have the chance to play under Riva Saki, whose Milan side was, were, were famous as one of the, the teams that changed the course of his football history with their pressing and that sort of thing. But Saki was very, very rigid um, and would often go with players who fit his system rather than the most talented players on the team. I mean, you remember uh, from, from uh, watching them as Ireland fans in, uh, in, at the World Cup in 94, his relationship with Roberto Baccio this was not it was not good. Um, so I don't know. I, I think the, the, the comparison, I suppose, with the City team is this: maybe the one that Mancini broke into as a as a young player, the one that went to Euro '88, the one that went to Italia '90, which was a, a group of under 21 players who had success on the one of the company men at the Italian Football Federation, is Elio Vicini, and they they just had a freshness about them. Um, I think. You really see that freshness again uh, in the cooking side. You just seem to be unburdened. You don't seem to, have, you don't seem to be feeling pressure. You don't seem to be excited to be at a major tournament. Certainly after missing the World Cup and after, what, 18 months of not playing in front of, in front of fans. Yeah. Great to have you with us, James. Thanks a million for joining us. Cheers. Pleasure, guys. James Horncastle there. You can read his stuff in The Athletic and, of course, you can watch him on BT Sport as well. OTBAM is brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. We'd love to hear from you. 0879-180-180. That's the WhatsApp number. Or, of course, you can leave a comment on the YouTube channel if uh, you want to. What's your take on where Italy are at the moment, Owen? Yeah, like we're moving right to the top of the pile uh, alongside Belgium at the moment. Uh, I do think that you, you can take your pick with, um, with, with France, Portugal and Germany maybe as well uh, in, a, in a tier just below that. But uh, I guess when you, when you look at early season form or early tournament form, you can only really blame the opposition so much considering some of the upsets that we've come close to seeing already. And uh, Italy and Belgium have kind of shown a new gear whenever a question's been asked of them so far. So your power rankings would be five... Germany, Let, four. Okay, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. See, I'm on, I'm on a spot here now. So let's go with five Germany. Let's go with. Uh, let's go with four. Portugal. Let's go with three. Italy. Let's go with two. France. And let's go with one. Belgium. And right. I hope I haven't said the same team twice there. You haven't, you haven't, but you did put um, Germany behind Portugal, even though Germany just beat Portugal for two. That's a good point. I did just do that, didn't I? Yeah, uh, that, that was. That's you pretty, can flip them around pretty, if you want. I'll let, I'll let you make that change. Yeah. I'll, I'll, you can change that one. So it's uh, Portugal five, Germany four. Yeah, let's go with that. Let's go with that. Let's go with a bit of recency bias. Nothing like it because Portugal have never come back from a disappointing uh, group stage result before to, to win the whole thing. We didn't mention Derry in the power rankings a little bit earlier on. I'm, I'm mildly obsessed with what's going on with uh, Derry football at the moment, mm. given that like they were very heavily criticised last year. But Rory Gallagher, very, very smart Gaelic football manager. They won the league uh, Division 3 final at the weekend with one of those performances where they, they're just like they're an unstoppable scoring machine at the moment. Like... Against, and so that Offaly team are good. They've had a good 18 months of progress now, it seems, under John Mon, and uh, they could do nothing. They, they, they kicked 1-3, but they scored the goal just before half-time. So essentially kicked three points in the first half and another three or four in the second half. Like, Derry, really strong defence, really free-flowing, free free-scoring football. It's only the league, but the championship starts next week. And, like, you look at their uh, regulation uh, statistics... They conceded 14 points in total in those three games and then obviously kept Offaly down to quite a small margin as well uh, at the weekend. So their defence is incredible. What we're seeing in attack, though, is probably what's, what's grabbing a lot of the headlines, and uh, rightly so. This is a team that represents a ginormous banana skin in what should be Donegal's second game in the Ulster Football Championship. So Donegal had to play a preliminary game against Down, and then if they win that... 
they'll have to play Derry. And I would say that if Donegal go into that game against Derry without Michael Murphy and maybe a little bit roughed up after the down experience, then I think that game is there for the taking. I think this entire Ulster Championship is there for the taking. Uh, in fairness, it, it proved to be the case last year. We think that maybe things are returning to a little bit more normality with maybe a fewer upsets this season. But I think what has happened with that Division 1 North is that we've seen that those four teams are quite close together mm. and maybe moving back just a little bit. Meanwhile, Derry are surging forward <laughs> and it could actually be one of the best modern Ulster Championships ever. It may not be one that produces an All-Ireland Championship. It may not be a, 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 an Ulster final like 2005, for example, but it may well be a better championship than the peak Armand Tyrone years. Yes, 21 points to 1-6, and Derry missed a penalty with the last kick of the game as well. To, uh, to I don't know, just very interested to see how they're going. Really unfortunate that there's no back door yeah. for us all to actually see what progress teams are making in the championship and to have some more games. But... Uh, I did see somebody over the weekend saying, is it too late? Can we, can we change this? I'm like, when you don't ask, you don't get. Is it too late? It's true. Can we not change it? It's, it's true. Can everybody like, not come together and go, look, look, new information came to light. And the rug really brings the room together. And we're bringing the back door back. Like, I mean, it's, it, the, the reason why they're not doing it, obviously, is to get the club season up and running. Uh, for teams that have been, would have been knocked out early in the, the back door, like, you probably would have got your club championship up and running at, at a similar time anyway. Um, like, I, I, I think it's hard to argue against the fact that last year's club season was so good that you can't really screw um, that, that championship over by, by not having it in, in full flow again in, in part of the summer as well this year. So that's why they've done it. But I still think that it may be the league could have been eaten into a little bit as well but then again the league was really good as it turned out but it just didn't matter in the end except for of course the entrepreneurial minds of Offaly and Derry who came together to actually play that game on Saturday which and yeah, a really and the, good idea and there was a crowd at it and it yeah. sounded loud and you know it was uh, some sense of normality for us as well it's uh, 22 minutes past 8 let's bring in the sports pages this morning on OTBM we're starting with OTBSports.com it's been an emotional week Anthony Eddy on qualifying for the Olympics that's the Rugby Sevens team uh, I almost wasn't here. Greg O'Shea and coming back to sevens after Love Island. Leona Maguire misses out on her first LPGA win by just two shots. Uh, Ireland men's seventh qualified for the Tokyo Olympics. And Gaza and Larson, United Celtic and Rangers fans, said Craig Brown on a piece that got a bit ratioed when uh, we put it out the other day. Craig Brown, obviously, um, saying that uh, the Celtic fans liked Paul Gascoigne and the Rangers fans liked Henrik Larson. I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but... <laughs> Certainly, uh, there you go. Just getting, uh, just getting caught up in all, all this, this uh, uh, cross divide love that we're feeling as a result of uh, Euro twenty twenty. Yeah, wouldn't it be great if we could be like this all the time? Uh, the Irish Times front page headline is Italy the team to fear as Verratti dazzles. That's uh, Barney Roney's piece, and then Ireland sevens qualify for the Olympics. And faultless Maguire maintains upward momentum. Is the headline on Philip Reid's piece there? Um, so she did. A bogey-free closing 66 for a 23 under par to finish two strokes back from Nelly Corda, who, of course, you don't know, you're too young to remember Peter Corda, are you? Yeah. The Czech tennis player? Yeah. Uh, well, that's his daughter. There you go. Uh, the Irish Sun this morning. Bare back pages. Stampadoo. Hey. That's a good headline. It is. Top of the morning to you. Uh, Stampadoo. Ten men through despite loss. This is Aaron Ramsey calling Ethan Ampadoo's dismissal in Rome. Harsh. Uh, was it harsh? No. Okay. It was there, correct. Seven's Tokyo Heaven. Cats that got the cream. This is the uh, Kilkenny winning the Komogi League. And Harry's on regardless is uh, the headline on the fact that Southgate has decided that uh, Harry Kane will start the game. The Herald back page is Bale. We had to dig deep to lose only 1 0. Children to consider fifth day for the festival in 2023. I think it's less a consideration, almost a fact at this point. The Irish Independent is switched to a five day Cheltenham now odds on. Um, and Ireland 7's team targeting Olympic medal. We were the last team to qualify. I think the fact that they got there this time, they should just go and have to crack and uh, perform as best as they can and not worry about medals. The front of the Telegraph, uh, Southgate gives Kane vote of confidence. The dreaded vote of confidence that uh, Harry Kane is definitely going to start. Does he, does he drop him then? And he's like, oh, I was just, I was, I was roping up in the Czech Republic. Uh, the Defiant Ones. Wales heroes dig deep after Ampadu's red to seal spot in the last 16. The Defiant Ones? The Defiant Ones. They were always this, this is uh, the, the Dr. Dre Netflix yeah. documentary. Yeah. But that was based 
there, there is another d the defined ones. Is there? There is like, a, is there a, a, some sort of Western? 1970s movie, is there? Defined ones, television series. Oh, it's the television series. There you go. No, well, no. No, oh, no, that, that was that. Sorry, that's the television series before that. I, I do think that there, there was some other um, piece of culture from your... 1958, 1958 film. Just a bit before your time. Who's the Jimmy Iovine in this? So that's what I was wondering, but... Uh, we're just... Two, we're two just, escaped prisoners who are shackled together. Okay, right. I okay. guess it just kind of speaks to the modernity and the hip nature of the show that we went for um, the Netflix documentary rather than that one. It's uh, Sidney Poitier and Tony Curtis. Great lineup! Wow. Um, I don't like. I mean, need, need to go and watch that one. Like, is there is there some sort of is there, is there something more than just the, the the snappy title that speaks to this Welsh team about that movie? I wonder. Good question. Owen. There Very go. good question. All the all the great rhetorical questions being asked this morning here in OTBM. The star, Roman Dry. Uh, Wales make it through despite defeat to Italy and Sevens Heaven. That's a picture of the Sevens team, and then Southgate Kane's our main man and cats have last laugh. Um, so that is the crack with that one. The male whales tails up. Defeat Italy fails to halt progress to last 16 and seven's heaven for men in green and classical Kenny uh, find another gear. So all the stories are essentially the same this morning. And then Southgate Kane's gonna be in my team, says the London Times. Hamilton lacked fight. Lewis Hamilton has slipped further behind Max Verstappen in the Formula 1 Drivers' Championship after the Dutchman overtook his title rival in the penultimate lap to seal the victory. It sounds like there was a bit of overtaking going on at the end. Verstappen's victory means the 23-year-old has extended his lead over the seven times world champion to 12 points, and Red Bull have pulled clear of Mercedes with a 37-point lead in the constructors' standings. Much bigger interest this year in Formula 1 because of the Netflix series? Yeah, it definitely seems that way, that uh, whenever something crazy happens, your timeline tends to erupt because of the, the Netflix series. It's done absolute wonders for the sport in general. And uh, the same can't be said of, of every sport that's had like big documentaries made of it. There's usually this very fleeting moment, but it seems that people have been woken up to not just uh, a fleeting interest in Formula One, but like a, a genuine deep-seated interest. And I guess it comes from maybe the length of the, the documentary series, multiple seasons, that definitely helps. And the fact that this is like an example of how to market a sport, uh, characters and storylines work. Access, yeah. Just give everybody access. It's like, oh, which is kind of part of why all of the stuff all of the media coverage really matters is that you become invested in the outcome yeah the more you know about the people who are involved so like all of those little bits those flash interviews afterwards the sticker books every, every little part of it is is important it seems uh, the guardian this morning their back page uh, fire still burns 10 man whales beaten by italy but progress um and Southgate says, fundamental Kane will start against Czech. We didn't talk about Harry Kane a little bit earlier on. What, what's going on? Why do you think he's flopping? It, like, it does seem, well, it's, it's, hard to, it's actually harder to make some sort of appraisal of his performance on Friday night, I think, than it was against Croatia. I think Croatia maybe looked at the start that it was quite obvious that he was, he was coming deep to get the ball, and maybe you'd have the likes of Mason Mount, and maybe even Calvin Phillips running beyond him and that is his role then he just kind of is the link man with those two runners and then he got Sterling and Foden and it all seems very well linked until then it didn't look well linked and on Friday it looked worse than the previous week where uh, maybe Kane was getting on the ball even less. I'd, I'd li actually like to, to, to see the, the comparison of his statistics. Either way they're both, uh, both of them are just the result of two pretty poor performances and maybe he's being used in not an amazing way like may maybe this is why the, the three at the back might be the way forward with, th with those wing backs and there's just you're forced to to go wide you're forced to to go down the touchline a little bit more and you're forced to whip in a few more crosses now i know they crossed the ball a bit on on friday night but maybe that's the sort of way that brings a, a number nine into play like we must keep in mind that harry kane has had one of his best ever seasons domestically after playing more of a withdrawn nine role himself anyway so uh, does Gareth Southgate pick up the phone to Jose Mourinho and, and ask him, what did he do? What, what, what on earth did he do to, to get the best out of Harry Kane in this deep position? Yeah. Is it possible Kane's form is gone? Like yeah. He's just not playing well? Because he's very streaky in the past. There have been periods where he would have eight, nine games where just not playing well and then suddenly come back again. Is it possible he's in the middle of one of those? Yeah. And I, I, I do think at times in the past when he's gone through those streaks of, of uh, like looking like he's quite average, he tends to still pop up with a goal every so often, and that, that's just not happening. And, and maybe it's because he has moved to a more withdrawn striker role down through the last five or six years. Maybe that's why he's not doing that, and he, he just doesn't have the opportunity 
to just score a tap in to get him back on form because that's maybe what all he needs to, to get back on form. It does seem that it is deeper than that, that it is how he's being utilised as a player. Now, in fairness, like against Croatia, Calvin Phillips was England's man of the match and you, you thought to yourself, right, that's why they play a withdrawn attacker because a player like him can get forward more than he does for, say, the Marcelo Bielsa Leeds team. Uh, and maybe that makes sense and you can see why they did it. But like, what, like is that a greater net gain for the team than a goal-scoring Harry Kane? Maybe after the Scotland game, Southgate will realise that perhaps it's not. Again, I think it comes back to the fact that if England come up against top-quality opposition, who will have more of the ball? I would l just love to see what they have to do here because like, m maybe this Croatia game like sticks in the crawl a little bit from them from, from 2018. Um, and maybe everything's based on coming up against a good team rather than what their plan was for Scotland or this version of that Croatia team. Uh, I, I still think there will, there will be a moment when England will look better at, in, in this competition. But Is it going to be tomorrow night against the Czech Republic? <clears throat> you wouldn't be sure, would no, you? No, I, I, I mean, look, I, I, I know, obviously, I, I think that they're better than uh, you're giving them credit for at the moment, but that Czech Republic game kind of difficult, isn't it? It's not the. It, this is the exact opposition they do not want exactly. to be playing at the moment. That yeah. that is very much that that is very much a tin of beans to be opened, and you don't have uh, a tin opener. Well, you do. You just refuse to use them. Jack Grealish <laughs> can do it. Jack Grealish is like a little human Swiss Army knife, and you're like, no, I don't need that one piece of kit that I have that would really help me out here because I know better. Yeah. Yeah, you're, like the, the Swiss Army knife won't, won't be utilised. Like maybe it's the perfect time to use the Swiss Army knife from the start. Like, what's the worst that can happen? Is is it a draw? Like it, it, five points would be. Uh, um, like they're, they're at this stage now, England, where they have four points. Four points might be good enough to get them through anyway. Probably would be good enough to get them through anyway. The difference between first and third at this moment, like if they were to lose two 0 it could be a disaster. Like the yeah. the. Um, there's going to be a lot of teams on four points. Yeah, I, I guess the point though is that Gareth Southgate's risk taking could be in offensive areas, and losing two 0 maybe wouldn't necessarily be an option. It could be like a crazy yeah. three-all draw or something. Yeah, and maybe that would be that would be better if they just got some sort of new, fresh kick from from an attacking substitute or something. Yeah, uh, from Grealish. And I, I mean, it, uh, apparently the Germans are astounded that uh, Sancho's not getting a look in. Yeah, but well, as they would be, like if the, if the tables were turned and you had. Uh, somebody like, uh, I don't know, maybe Phil Foden not getting a look in in, in the, the German team if he happened to be German and he was playing in England. I'm sure the English press would be like, what's going on here? So like they've just seen a lot more of uh, Jadon Sancho than a lot of the English press have and that's why it's a much bigger deal over there at the moment. But you have to think that if he's not on, like with all due respect to Aston Villa and, and to, I love Jack Reed, I think he's had a phenomenal season. But like Jadon Sancho should be playing at a similar level to Jack Grealish, if not a higher level all season. And you would have thought that he could be getting a lot more game time than than Grealish, all things being equal. But then again, Grealish has been magnificent. So my, my point earlier when I was asking about Pep, would Pep have them all in the team? Like, I, I can't, you know, he'd have... Uh, he'd have Mares and Foden and... Uh, who else he, would, he wouldn't pick Sterling for wouldn't. really, unless it's the actual final, and decides to trust him for that game. He like so. Who, who's your Fernandinho and your Rodri? So he's he's dropping Declan Rice and he's dropping Calvin Phillips. Uh, he's uh, definitely playing Mason Mount. Uh, Pep is he's de he's playing Jude Bellingham. Uh, he's playing Sancho. He's playing Foden. Uh, he, like I mean, Pep is not stupid. He's going to play Harry Kane. Is he definitely? Is, are, is there are there games where it's like I'm going to play Harry Kane in some games? I'm not going to play him in other games. These games against Scotland, I'm not playing Harry Kane because they expect me to. I'm going to play Foden and Grealish, and Sancho. And Sancho. Who's your Who's your central player there? But like, honestly, Grealish can play centrally. Yeah. Just drop drop it. Like I mean, he, yeah, and uh, like, uh, and then it becomes kind of like a almost a two up front with him, maybe dropping a little bit deeper, or like, can, can he lead a line? Like I know, uh, like a uh, Pep Guardiola side hasn't really gone that way in recent years, but I do think that that's because of the relative quality he's had at number nine as opposed to some sort of massive philosophical shift. Like he does like to get the ball into the box and belt the ball across the face of the goal as we've seen quite a bit in his Euros. And like would you rather have an out and out number nine who can do that and be on the end of those balls or, or would you rather have a, a winger who's actually been in Probably, there? probably. So, but at the same time, maybe there's a control of the game element that he thinks you can do more of with those guys. I don't know. Yeah, I don't, like you're, you're looking through the, the bench the other day as well, and 
like when it comes to these moments in a tournament when a team isn't going well everything just starts to look a little bit worse the squad starts to look a little bit thinner and you're like who can actually uh, make that difference you're, you're so suddenly looking at like Dominic calvert loon and you're you're wondering is is that the guy to make a difference i know that's not the type of player that england are going to to use from the start because kane still has that jersey very much in, but even someone like marcus rashford is starting to be like not necessarily sure if he brings the difference. So if this is a team that's winning, you're looking at that bench and you're like, they still have these guys to come. Yeah. And it's all uh, rose in the garden. But at the moment, it's kind of like, are these the guys to make the difference? Yeah, I don't know. And I, I don't think it is rose in the garden at the moment because like Kane is obviously under a lot of pressure. But who are you replacing him with Marcus Rashford, who is not in form? Like, or are you replacing him with Dominic Calvert-Lewin, who is off the back of one good season? But like, are you trusting him to win you the Euros at this stage? Yeah, like, uh, uh, the, uh, yeah, so you're not. But um, I guess the thing with Kane as well, which maybe is something we're overlooking here a little bit, is that he's truly unique in terms of what he brings compared to everybody else in that squad. So Dominic Calvert-Lewin, a bit of a different player. Yes, he can hold up the ball, and I'm sure he could do what Kane does, but he is more of an out-and-out -out nine who gets in the ends of balls and is, is like an Inzaghi type Player. He's been compared with, with Inzaghi, wasn't he, by, by Ancelotti already this season, um, last season. Harry Kane, meanwhile, has kind of developed into a different sort of player entirely, and there isn't a like and like like for like replacement for Harry Kane, which maybe is a factor in this that he's not just a, the leader and the captain, and uh, Saka can't afford to piss him off. There's also an element here where, like, sure, you can say a Grealish can play through the middle, but really, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if anybody can do what Harry Kane is supposed to be doing for this team quite like Harry Kane. Yeah, who isn't doing it? Who, who who isn't doing it? You're sticking, the, you're, what you're saying issue. is you're sticking with Kane, irrespective at this stage, because he's got enough credit in the bank for you that all the conversation around dropping him is complete nonsense. You just need to let him get some form, and it might be that he scores a hat trick in this game and then goes on. Like uh, you know, just one counter attack is all I ask. Yeah, gods of uh, football. That, that's all. That's all I would be asking if I was an England fan. Just just let us see this team on the break rather than uh, the, these tins of beans, please. And maybe we'll see a different version. Uh, like, it's just the, the slow... It's just, it's just the pace, really, isn't it? it they're just so slow, and build-up play is uninspiring because it is slow. And all of a sudden, you've got your best goal scorer coming deep to try and help out and try and pick up the pace. And he's also a little bit slow over the first five yards until he actually builds up ahead of steam. But guess what? When you're under counter-attack, you can, like, get really fast with momentum over a period of time, and all of a sudden, you look like Usain Bolt but uh, not in this current system. Look, Lineker won the Golden Boot in 86 without well, scoring in the first two games and did score a hat-trick in the third game. So we'll have to wait and see if uh, that's about to happen for that one. Also, the, the Ireland-England game was on, uh, the World Cup game from 1990 was on Air Sports uh, last night or yesterday at some stage. I was flicking through and I flicked on just as Lineker got taken off to be replaced by Steve Bull. I was like, I'd, <laughs> I'd forgotten about that now. Is that, one, that was out one-all, was it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so like I mean that you know it was by that stage he'd already won the Golden Boot and had been to Barcelona and was like definitely considered to be one of the best strikers in the world and it's like yeah Bobby Robson's taking him off we're chasing a goal here now he had had an incident in the game where there was clearly yeah. some kind of stomach ailment that was but he was smiling coming off you know <laughs> that's what happens like I mean if you're in that position you're going to be smiling just everything is fine. Yeah, everything is definitely fine. I'm just going straight down the tunnel here. Yeah, like that I'm man. Sit on the bench. That man was not healthy uh, <laughs> uh, th that day, and uh, still scores uh, a great goal. Uh, like, it, it, but it, I, I'd forgotten about that actually. I, I, I had no idea actually that he gets um, taken off in that game. But uh, like, it, 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 it's kind of uh, you can kind of c compare the two situations. Um, but yeah, they, it, they, there's certainly form in the English dugout of like taking off star players when maybe they don't necessarily want to be taken off. Yeah. All right. I'm going to bring you a little bit of this. Uh, we're going to bring you the full version of this a little bit later on. Mario Rosenstock joined John Duggan on Sunday's OTB. We'll bring you the full thing a little bit later on. But in the meantime, have a quick look. This to me is something that is just a means to an end. Do you, am I being cynical now? This, um, this tour of South Africa. It is, but I think you're missing the point. I do believe we'll get three fantastic tests. And isn't that all what it's all about? I mean, the Lions, in theory, is the most contrived corporate um, uh, a thing you could imagine. However, it does produce um, utterly s compelling sport. So, for example, the, the, the whole, you take it from, let's say, 1971, when the Lions went down to New Zealand, or 1974, where that most famous tour of all time in the, in, with the Springboks. So apartheid uh, 
sort of South Africa and also the 99 call and Willie John McBride and all that and the the uh, bonhomie and the camaraderie of the team which joined them together and overcame the Springboks to the 2005 disaster to the own you know to 97 triumph in South Africa and to the 17 2017 draw it can it really really produces wonderful sport John and one of the reasons it does is it's a little bit like the Ryder Cup basically the the Southern Hemisphere teams, South Africa, New Zealand, and Australia, basically get, get the hump that the Europeans can come down and think they can do it to them. And they go, we're the home of rugby. We'll show you. And that's what makes it a, a really interesting tussle. Um, and it's, of course, the whole idea of the bonding of the, 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 the GB and Ireland sides. Um, to bond together uh, to overcome this uh, obstinate um, <laughs> uh, foe, you know. But I think it's the what makes it interesting. What's, what gives it the edge? It's it's this, it's the it's the it's the hubris and obstinacy of the southern hemisphere, which gives it the edge against the sort of you know Captain Bly uh, mutiny on the bounty. Um, we're coming down. We're going to take the island. <laughs> we're going to take the island, Fletcher Christian. We're going to take it. We're going to take it. No, you will not, sir. And then the New Zealanders there, you know, yeah, you'll take it, all right. You'll take it right up the jacksie. Um, you know, so there's a real edge there, which, which, which I love. So I think you'll get some great rugby. We, we think you're going to get some great rugby over the next um, two months, essentially. I'm very excited to let you know that we're going to be broadcasting every single minute of every single game of the Lions Tour, starting this Saturday with the game against Japan. Our coverage is going to be brought to you in association with Vodafone, lead partner of the British and Irish Lions. So Brian O'Driscoll, Keith Wood, Ron O'Gara, Alan Quinlan and everybody else you'd expect to be involved in our coverage of the Lions uh, with Neil Tracy on commentary duty for those nine games uh, which start. We're still no significant uh, injuries really with the exception I think at this point of Andrew Porter. So it's all present and correct but obviously the first game proper happens next weekend. Uh, Ronan Kelleher is still training with them but not yet officially a member of the touring partner so so close he can smell it they just haven't given him his gear they've probably fitted him for it <laughs> that's a difficult situation uh, fitted for the suit he's uh, just like, in case like, it fits come on come on and then the bus leaves and you're getting s still there trained to did you see that video of the Italian team bus leaving the other day and they almost left Viali behind? No. Like, I mean, Viali in his uh, typically languid style uh, didn't even run after the bus, just sauntered up as the bus stopped and opened its door for it. That will be Andrew Porter, except... Or not Andrew Ron Porter, Kelleher. Ronan Kelleher, sorry. That will be Ronan Kelleher, except he will still be standing there and the bus won't open its door for him and it will just drive away. And it'll be sad. Like, maybe they should just let him in and... Uh, Come on, just... bring him. What's the difference? It's not like the, it's not like World Rugby are saying you can't have one extra player. It's yeah. like they've, they've decided themselves the size of their touring party. G give him a cap is, is, like, all we ask is... Like, they probably have his cap fitted as well. Like, th this is... And, and it's terrible, really. And where, where will that year go when Ronan Keller doesn't use it? I don't know. I don't know. Let's go back to the football. Andy Mitten is with us. Andy, good morning to you. How are you? Good morning, I'm okay, thanks. Hope you are too. Yeah, yeah. Well, how's your tournament been so far? I haven't talked to you in a while. Busy. I'm in Amsterdam at the moment and I've been on the road for 10 days and I think I've been to five different cities. This is the first day when it's not been bright sunshine. Uh, London was glorious and then I've been in Munich, Copenhagen, which was incredible, uh, Seville, and now I'm here in Amsterdam ahead of Holland against North Macedonia. And it's uh, it's raining, but I, I didn't repeat the mistake I made in Euro 2016 and only take t-shirts and shorts. I thought there's a fair chance that we're going to have a couple of bad days. I've really enjoyed it. It's very complicated travelling, but that's sort of become my norm now. I'm having COVID tests most days. Copenhagen was really alive, and that's probably been my favourite place so far. Partly because the stadium was full. There was a lot of emotion because of what had happened to Christian Eriksen. It was a really good game between Denmark and Belgium. Uh, Munich was good as well. That pass from Paul Pogba was probably the best individual moment that I saw. And I'm, I'm travelling on. I'm in London tomorrow. I'm back in Seville on Wednesday. I'll be going to, to Baku and then back in London uh, for the final, well, it'll be 31 days away in total. So it, it is really full on. And I realise I'm very lucky to do this and to be paid for this and to do it as a job. But you, you've got to look after yourself as well. You can't be going out drinking each night. You've got to 
you know, eat well, try and sleep well, because when you're coming through airports, you're having to present four, five, six different pieces of documentation and compared to normal and miss one and you don't get on the flight. I've seen people missing flights basically on every single flight I've been on. Right, and is that they're missing flights because they don't have the right uh, COVID documentation, they haven't done a test or something like that? Yeah, or each country has got different rules. So to get into Holland, you need a PCR test. To get into the UK, you need an antigen test. And it's complicated, and I travel a lot, you know. It's, I do it for my job all the time, and it's still very complicated. The idea of trying to do it with, with a family would just be, it just wouldn't, wouldn't be possible. And they're checking all the documentation, which is quite right that they should be doing that. I did laugh when the border official in Bavaria looked at my accreditation picture, which had been taken having queued in the, in the sun in London the previous day, and I had a really red face, and he just laughed at me and went, come on. And I thought, I like this, getting a bit of abuse off a German border official. <laughs> but it, it is complicated, and then each country has got the different nuances. In Bavaria, they were chasing me up. You've not done your COVID test today. Where is it? Uh, in, in Spain was the most difficult country to get in. If you were British up until March, now it's the easiest one to get in. But it depends where you're coming from. If you go from, from Holland, you need a test. If you go from England, you don't need a test. So you've, you've really got to be on top of it. And it's not like you just get an instruction saying Munich PCR test. You get sent a link and you get sent down this rabbit hole and you end up reading 3,000 words and you come out of it thinking, I'm not sure what's required here. And... It's just really complicated, but that has become my norm now. So I know that when I finish this call, I've got to fill in a load of forms to get back into the UK tomorrow. I've got to get another COVID test outside the stadium today in Holland. And in between all that, I've got to do my job as a journalist. I've got to hit the streets. I've got to speak to people. I've got to interview people. I've got to go to the, the matches. And so you, you, I'm not getting a minute, but it, it's a buzz as well. It, the, the atmosphere has been really good in, in most of the cities and the cities I've mentioned, they're among the finest in Europe. I'm pretty saddened that I'll, I'm not going to Dublin because I'd booked to go to Dublin, I'd booked my hotels in Dublin and Bilbao and those were the two cities which pulled out and that's pretty sad because you know I like both of those cities as yeah. well. We, look, we're we're pretty sad, especially the way things have worked out. We more than likely everything would have been fine. We would have been able to have um, spectators. And we, anyway, look, you, you, we're picking at a, a scab here that hasn't quite healed on our side. Uh, just last question on this before we get into some of the football. Huge criticism of Platini when the idea was floated in many places, and I I I did not think it was a good idea at the time. And now that it's happened, I'm like, this is a great idea. Can we do this forever? What's your take having actually seen the impact that it is having a pan-European European championships? Well, I didn't like the idea at first. I like being in a country when tournament fever takes over. And I'm only really... I'm a football fan at heart, but I'm only seeing it as a paid journalist. It's, very, it's costing someone a lot of money to send me to all of these different uh, countries. And I always have sympathy with fans with things like ticket prices. The ticket prices are really high. I met, I met Spain fans the other day. They're paying 120, 140, 170 to watch that as well. well the, the game wasn't even a, a good game. But I can, I can see some merit in Denmark being at home, in Spain being at home, in Holland being at home, in England being at home. You can see, I'm not sure how it all connects up or, or how all these dots connect, but individually, the cities have been good. And you, you do sense, uh, I wouldn't say a fever, because we're coming out of a hibernation, but I've really been cheered just seeing people enjoy themselves, just hearing humans sing, just seeing football fans going up to a group of French fans outside the town hall in Munich and saying your national anthem's not a bad one. And them saying to me, do you want me to sing it? And they all start singing it. And I live for them moments, those interactions with fans. I like getting down on the streets and speaking to people. And my experiences have been really positive so far. I'm not sure how I'm going to fare today because it's raining really hard in Amsterdam, but I've had a good run so far. Uh, we talked a little bit about Spain at the weekend. You, you mentioned the fact that the fans who paid those extraordinary prices have been served up a fairly poor fare uh, so far. What, what's going wrong with Spain at the moment? With Spain, you've got a manager who's 
putting a, young, a lot of young players through. The team are in transition. They are not the vintage Spain of, of 08, of being world champions in 2010, European champions 2012. Luis Enrique, I think he's a great manager, and I think he's a very interesting person. And I, I've, I've been one of the very few journalists who's interviewed him at his home in depth. He's absolutely fascinating. This is a man who when he stopped playing, travelled around Europe with a hood up, watching derby games by himself, because he wanted to experience what it was like to stand on the cop at Liverpool, for example. But he's getting a bit of criticism because Spain are not beating pretty average international teams. The strikers have been struggling. Alvaro Morata, he scored at the weekend, and he was supported, but he wasn't supported in the previous game against Sweden. Once again, Spain had 70, 80, 81% possession but they're not scoring. Nil-nil, 1-1. And it's becoming a burden. It's becoming a struggle. They've got individually very, very good players. Pedri's 18. He's a fantastic player. But Spain are not breaking teams down in a sense of frustration. Second half against Poland on Saturday, everything was going out to the wings. It was their version of Route 1. They thought, what we're doing is not working. And they don't have the great strikers like David Villa, Fernando Torres, but Gerard Moreno's had a great season. I'm not going to remind myself of him scoring in the uh, Europa League final against Manchester United, but he's a, he's a top striker. And Spain haven't always been about absolute number nines anyway. They don't have Iniesta anymore. They don't have Xavi. No one in Spain expects them to get to the semi-finals. Maybe not even the quarter-finals, but the way it's looking at the moment, Spain have got their own final against Slovakia on Wednesday, and they've got to win that. Uh, to, to have a proper chance of going through. Yeah, it seems that even when Alvaro Morata scores, that he is often the fall guy for uh, a performance anyway. The, the, the penalty debacle was was quite something. Is, is it just performance anxiety with him at, at, at the moment, do, do you feel, Andy? Or do you think that there is just something missing from his performances when he puts on the, the international jersey? There's definitely a level of anxiety. He's one of those strikers, and I've spoke to players who've played with him. Um, someone who played with him in Turin said he needs to feel loved, he needs to feel confidence. And I can remember Morata coming through the Real Madrid's B team and watching him against Barca's B team 11 years ago. And he was the next big thing. But even then, people were saying, is he good enough to become the next big thing? Well, he, he, he's a top striker, but he's not a top, top level striker, I, I don't think. Because look at the clubs that he's been at. He's been at quite a lot of clubs. Already, would Chelsea fans say that he's been a standout hero for them? Probably not. And for the national team, he is the fall guy. He's the guy who bears the brunt of the whistles, of the criticism. And I, I don't think that's fair because it is a collective. And Luis Enrique was strident in his defence of him last week. And I was pleased being in the stadium on Saturday night in Seville. The fans really did get behind Morata. There was definitely a sense of this hasn't been fair. And there was a lot of relief when he scored. And he ran straight to Luis Enrique. But then you saw the debacle with the with the penalty with him and, and Gerard Moreno. And look, if Spain are not beating Poland and they're not beating Sweden at home, there's going to be criticism. There was also criticism of Luis Enrique because uh, he didn't take the full allocation of players he could have used, 24 instead of 26. He took nobody from Real Madrid. And... Like it or not, Real Madrid are the biggest team in Spain. And Real Madrid fans like to see their players playing for Spain. And Sergio Ramos' is, is absence looks more telling with each game because he's just a winner. He's a serial winner. No one in football wins like Sergio Ramos. So Luis Enrique likes to do what he wants to do. He absolutely won't be told to do what to do by, by the media. But he'll pay for it if Spain don't go through. Very interesting uh end to the group season, uh, group series for, for them. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the uh, Pogba issue. You, you've written extensively for The Athletic about why Pogba's playing better with France. What, what, have you, what are your conclusions about what it is? Is it just that the role is more clearly defined and also he's playing with some better cohort in midfield in particular at France than he is at Manchester United? Yeah, I, I wrote that piece on Friday for the Athletic and I speak to people, spoke to people who know him very, very well. So they are better qualified to talk than I am. But I can take what their words and and I can use them and their information. And there's a, one of the points is what you touched on. He's playing with better players for France. Another one is that he doesn't feel the pressure for France. 
feels the absolute confidence of his manager. That's not to say he doesn't have a good relationship with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer at United, because he does. And he just is far more comfortable playing for France. He didn't have a bad season for Manchester United, but he's got this really uneasy, real, not uneasy, this sort of hot and cold relationship where he can be man of the match and then do something terrible even within the same game. He takes these risks. I spoke to someone at Manchester United uh, about w- w- why is he doing better for France than he is for United. And one of the points put back to me was that when he played in Italy, when he plays for France, it's slower. He has more time on the ball. When you're in the Premier League, you've got players straight on top of you from all 19 other teams, whether it's Burnley or or um, Sheffield United, they're straight in your face. And that doesn't help his game. We've seen him have great games for Manchester United, but he just seems to be more confident when playing uh, for, for France and trying things which which come off. And I'm not saying he's been bad for Manchester United, but fans are still divided on Pogba. Uh, I, I'm told that he's amenable to staying. Go back to December, you wouldn't have found many Man United fans who wanted him to stay because of the comments of his, of his agent. So that doesn't help in club football either, whereas he's never going to say, look, I'm going to move him from France to join Luxembourg or to join Spain because it's, it's international football. So I think it's a combination of smaller factors. And there was another point to me about structure. The structure of, of, of Spain, of France, is very defined. Deschamps gave him his debut eight years ago. Pogba knows exactly what his role is, whereas at Manchester United, he's been moved around quite a lot. During that game in Munich last week, I got a text off one of Pogba's um, family and it just said different animal as a compliment because he was playing so well. I don't know whether that meant different animal for France as opposed to Manchester United. But I actually really enjoyed watching him play. I'd like to see him stay at Manchester United. Every United fan would like to see better players around uh, Paul, Paul Pogba. Uh, but it's also a joy watching him play for France. And yet it's also frustrating because he looks like one of the best players in the world. And that's not always the case for United. Yeah, I don't know. Is it fixable at United? Could they get this Pogba, this version of Pogba out? Or is the best thing, like the reports this morning are that they're going to, and I don't know how accurate these are, but there is a suggestion, and no doubt it's coming from an agent somewhere, that they're set to make him the highest paid player in English football with a new contract. Is that the right thing to do for Manchester United? I think United will be, will, will offer him a new contract. Uh, I think United will obviously pay, pay him well. But United are wary because they had the pants pulled down with Alexis Sanchez. They gave, they made David De Gea the best-paid goalkeeper in the world, and now they're in a situation where United don't want to actively sell him. But even if they wanted to, it would be difficult because he earns so much money. So he'll be well paid at United, and it almost suits United that he hasn't been the absolute standout player because there's no from Real Madrid or PSG to sign. Paul Pogba. So I've been saying since February that he is amenable to stay in, that he's happier playing in a more advanced role because he likes that advanced role uh, for for Manchester United and he's got a good relationship with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, as, as I've said. So I wouldn't be surprised if he signs a contract. And I think United fans would just like to see a bit more consistency. And to be fair, he, he has had some pretty serious injuries, so if you could have a bit of luck with not not getting injured, but it, it, it is there, there's, it's paradoxical because on one hand his shirts sell lots, and on another the fans still don't have a song for Paul Pogba. There's no evidence on Paul Pogba's Twitter biography that he plays for Manchester United. I think it says he's a an athlete for Adidas, something like that. So he's got this relationship where. Uh, he, he definitely feels that he gets criticised by the, the media in England, and part of him, I think, has just given up on. You know, he doesn't want to try and win anyone over. And yet, when he goes away with France, he he doesn't feel that he needs to do that. So, I think he'll he'll stay at United. Uh, I hope he'll stay. A lot of United fans would not agree with me there, but I still think that there's a world class player there. We just like to see it more at Old Trafford. Uh, and the Dutch, finally, Andy, um, uh, their performances have been a bit better, I think, than a lot of people expected so far. Is is that anachronistic? Is it going to continue? What's your take on them? 
who knows with the Dutch, they normally either rip themselves apart internally or win the competition. Uh, this is their first tournament in seven years, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, they've won both of their matches. They've been at home. I think it slightly surprised people. Holland produces wonderful uh, players. I wouldn't say the favourites, but that probably suits them. Uh, their group has been quite an easy one. I think there's a sense here from me speaking to people that Memphis Depay needs to raise his game because he's seen as one of the star players in, in, a, in a young team. Uh, they're going to go through what's going to happen when Holland come up against uh, a Germany or, or a France or I was going to say England, but I'm not entirely convinced by England uh, myself. But it's definitely been um, a, a slight surprise that, 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 that they've done OK so far. All right. Andy, we'll let you go. Thanks a million for joining us. Cheers. Thank you. Andy Mitten gave us uh, some thoughts from his pan-European adventure there. OTBAM brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. If you've got anything you want to talk to us about this morning, you can get us on WhatsApp 0879-180-180 or, of course, you can always get us uh, using the hashtag OTBAM on Twitter as well. That was our Euros debrief with Andy Mitten there. I, I like the idea about that European travel. It, yeah, it's like the, the more the tournament goes on, the the more exciting it seems. Because I guess when you think about a tournament in one country, I guess you're you're attracted to all the varying uh, atmospheres around the different country. Like even just the most recent example, there, were, there was a real sense around Russia that like Samara and Moscow were very different, and that you'd have the the very different atmospheres, uh, very different climates at, at times in these stadiums. And maybe this is just that but through different countries and it's it's kind of like what we're experiencing at the moment and sometimes like if, if you haven't seen where a certain game is going to be played you kind of turn on the tv and you're like all oh, right this is copenhagen or Budapest yeah. because the stadium is full and yeah. it's, it's really atmospheric yeah i think so look anyway we'll, we'll come back to that because there's plenty to get stuck into and that we want to turn our attention to the weekend's camogie though um it ended up being a really interesting league final they did have a proper league final where there was uh, something on the line. I'm delighted to say Sarah Donovan is here with us to talk to us about this. Sarah, can Kenny beat Galway in a game that um, seems to have lived up to the rivalry that these two teams have had in recent seasons in that it was pretty close to the end. And uh, are, is it fair to say these are the best teams in the country at the moment? I think so. It was an incredible game to watch. I was in Croke Park. It was the first time, obviously, being back in Croke Park in over a year. The pitch was immaculate. So we were right down near the front, actually, and... The margin for error from the players is so small on that amazing pitch. It was end to end, helter skelter. It ended up being a point, you know, going into injury time and Kilkenny just pulled clear. So what was that actually like being in Croke Park then? Weird. Uh, at one point during the first half, uh, booming over the, the speakers was, please wear your masks. And everyone just started laughing. We were like, what? <laughs> it, it felt like it was coming from, from the heavens. Um, but a really, really positive experience. The stewards were brilliant. Um, Cusack stand was where everyone was sitting. Obviously, the players were over in the Hogan stand. The sun was splitting the stones, so it was a real kind of championship feel to the game. And because of the intensity of the game, that added to the whole experience. Yeah, I, I definitely feel like uh, all of the league games this year in all of the championships matter far more than they have done. Maybe maybe hurling is the the, the one exception because obviously uh, Limerick are so far ahead of everybody, it seems. But it's, it does feel like it's going to be very difficult for teams who aren't playing well at the moment in any of the championships to wrestle back some form in the next two weeks before everything starts properly. It's been such a condensed season. We've had eight weeks with our players and, you know, we played Kilkenny four weeks ago and then Kilkenny were on the pitch last night playing for the big prize. It's very hard to, to kind of, as you said, claw back that that intensity that you that you need. And that comes with being with teams from November right through to June, July and building that momentum. So there will be kind of teams who will really enjoy the condensed period and other teams will hate it. And what is what's your fixture schedule like now in terms of the championship? When does it kick off? So we finished up on Saturday uh, with a win over Waterford. Uh, Waterford were relegated, unfortunately, but uh, we survived, stopped the rot. And we have a month now to our championship. So our group is Cork, Waterford again, and down uh, in group two. So we'll have three consecutive games from the 17th of July and try to get into a quarterfinal. OK, uh, it, it's like uh, the fact that there's three games, It you know, and it sounds like it's a, a reasonable format for the season that's in it. It is. And look, there's 12 teams involved. Um, 
our group, uh, I suppose, is not the group of death. Uh, the group of the death very much looks like Galway, Kilkenny, Clare and Westmeath. Two teams come out of the group, obviously, and with both teams in Croke Park last night, you'd say Galway and Kilkenny would be the two teams that would automatically come out of uh, group three. But look, I'm not writing off Clare or Westmead, but I'm just saying, based on last night's performance, you couldn't you know, see anything but that result. So do, do you guys now taper off a little bit for the month or, or how are you going to approach that month off? Look, from our point of view, we had gone to what gone to Offaly, obviously, to play Waterford in a game that was incredibly important for us because a Dublin team heading to Division Two in a county where ladies' football is so incredibly popular, it would have brought Dublin back, you know, years in terms of our development as, as a Camogie county. So now we have to drive on, and we have to. Put the put the boot down and get into uh, a quarter final because we need Dublin Camogie to be popular. We need it to be successful so that players at 16, 17, 18 are going. I want to play Camogie. I don't want to play ladies football. As much as I love ladies football, you know, there's enough ladies footballers in the country. We need more Camogie players. Is that a constant battle? Is there is there a sense that maybe in some of the more traditional Camogie areas that they're now just producing some of their best footballers in the county? Absolutely. You know, and with with the fact that the ladies football is constantly on the TV, it is a more attractive sport to play and it's more visible. Whereas last night, you know, prime TV spot 7.30 on RT2 and a game that really delivered. I think the more you show Camogie, the more interested players will be to play it. And that's why it was important for us to win on Saturday. So that players knew that next season we're going to be playing Kilkenny, Galway, uh, Tipperary, Cork. And then those 16, 17, 18 year olds decide that they want to play Camogie for us. I thought it was interesting. It's an interesting time slot, uh, Sunday evening, late. Um, you know, it's innovative and it's flexible. And I know the various associations always come in for a lot of criticism, but credit where it's due, a half seven throw in, that's pretty interesting. I really enjoyed it. And I think, obviously, from you know traveling point of view, from Galway, from Kilkenny, they would have got back late last night, half, you know, half ten, half eleven. But you know what? I don't think anybody minds because it's it's was the new normal, and it was great to be in that setting. Um, so they took advantage of it, and it worked. It paid off. Yeah, I mean, like I, I, I know the travel is a big issue for people who, uh, after the match, they're winding down and they've all got to go to work today, as we know. But at the same time, if there's some way of making this possible, like if they could take Sunday evenings. Um, and that be a camogie thing, that'd be a massive breakthrough. Look, it it worked last night, and you know, I I think the game really delivered. The Denise Gall got a score on the sideline under the stands late on. You know, it it's Henry Shefflin could have done it. You know, I she scored six points. Uh, Steffi Fitzgerald came on late as a sub, scored another incredible point. These scores need to be on television. Neve Kilkenny scored a goal. She travelled fifty yards with the ball needs to be on television. We need to see this. Players need to know what the standard is. So it's really important. And if that's the only window that we got yesterday and we took it and our players were available to do it, hats off to the Camogie Association. I rarely, mm. rarely um, give them credit. And uh, I'm delighted to be on the show today giving them credit. The, the best part about it all, of course, was that there was just a, a few enough people in the stadium that you could still hear the shouts of the coaches. And when Aoife Doyle scores that goal, which is a cracker of a goal, you can hear, take her on Aoife, take her on Aoife, get out in front of her. And this is like the key thing. I think it's just proof that we need to mic up all the coaches at all oh, times yeah. in all facets of Gaelic games. Oh, I wouldn't recommend it. I had, I was having a, a, a fight with the with the fourth official on, on Saturday and you really didn't want to know what I was saying. Oh, we do, we official. do. That's the thing. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> no, 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 no. Beep, 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 yeah. beep. beep. <laughs> <laughs> Live beat button. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting being on the sideline for the for these games, and then you know, you, I suppose your language has to be so positive. So yeah, you're you're taking your life in your hands if you're micing us up on a Saturday. <laughs> I think. Uh, I wanted to ask one last question about uh, new new rules. Obviously, uh, a bit bit more contact allowed and a quick freeze inside the forty five. What's the crack with that? Yeah, it's brilliant. So if your defender is fouled, obviously when they're coming out with the ball and they've, they're having the momentum and, you know, it's a transition play, we're obviously trying to get the ball as quickly up the field to our forwards as we can. And you have a cynical half forward who decides to knock over a, a wing back and, and slow everything down. And defender can just get up and take the ball from their hand and strike the ball 40, 50 yards from their hand immediately. Um, and that means then obviously that that momentum that they lost is, is immediately given back. It's really, really positive. 
Um, it, it just, it's something that our backs have to kind of get, I suppose, get into very quickly. Um, and, and I noticed in the game the last day, there was three or four chances where they just got up after being barreled to the ground and whipped the ball down the field 40, 50 yards. Because the tactical fouling by half forwards is one of the things, like, I don't know, maybe maybe because we're seeing points scored from so far in, in hurling, it, there'll be less of it. But it's certainly one of the things that has been a bit of a blight in the game. If there's a turnover, you foul, everybody resets their defensive. It's interesting that Camogie's come up with a, a way of getting around that. Really novel. And, you know, at one stage um, on Saturday, um, like, you know, Orla Gray, I think 50, 60 yards down on top of our corner forward, and we re immediately have the impetus. And, and that's what's really attractive about it. So it's just about obviously getting players to click on because it's such a new rule and it's been brought in so quickly and we've had such little time with them that these are the small margins that are going to win championship games in the summer. And uh, the increased level of uh, permissible contact, what's, what is the... How's that playing out with the players? <laughs> Ooh, um, I, I think I think they're still getting used to it. I suppose the the beauty of it is now is if you hear a slap or if you hear a hurley, the referee's not inclined to to go for the whistle because there is contact allowed, so he'll have a think about it. So you you do get away with more, which is very attractive when you're playing such an aggressive style of camogie as we're trying to play in Dublin. All right. Well, <laughs> look, I think. Uh, it's all good for business. Great to have you with us, Sarah. Thanks a million. Cheers. Thanks a million. Bye now. Sarah Dunham giving us some updates on what's going on in the Camogie after Kenny won the league in front of a crowd of about 3,000 at Croker against Galway yesterday. And of course, uh, Dublin beat Waterford in that relegation playoff by a point at the weekend as well. Although Waterford were the favourites for that one. Uh, let me tell you about what's coming up on OTB Sports Radio across the course of the rest of the day before the show at 7 o'clock tonight on Off the Ball on News Talk. Um, I actually don't have the uh, stuff in front of me right now. There you go. Uh, Brian had just gone meets Ethan Asewa. That is one o'clock. Our State of the Union with Keith Wood at three. The Split Seasons, our documentary series from last year. And OTV Gold is Michael Owen on Life After Football. Uh, Michael Owen was a brilliant studio guest. Uh, very different persona from the um, person who was so roundly criticised when he was making his debut as um, a co-com on BT. But I, I think there's definitely something there. Uh, that uh, maybe we will see with time to come. We're going to take a quick break. We're back talking golf with Nathan Murphy and John Rand's victory at the US Open next. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. Have you subscribed to the OTB Football Podcast? If not, here's some of what you've missed over the last week. He put his hands on my, my shoulders and he started singing that Don't Worry Be Happy song to me. <laughs> I mean, it was blood and thunder and going in for tackles that, you know, he wouldn't normally go in for. I try and, like, want them to go in, like, my wife's English, the kid, uh, kids are happy, but I just can't bring myself to... For the best Euro 2020 coverage, subscribe now to the OTB Football Podcast wherever you get your podcasts and download the OTB Sports app. Sean, what's that thing going round the garden? That is my, uh, our new Husqvarna auto mower. Auto mower? Yeah, it's a robotic lawn mower from Husqvarna. Cuts the grass automatically, has GPS tracking and an app. Even works in the rain. Hmm. I just thought, why spend time cutting grass when I could spend it with the family? Great! You can put the dinner on, so. Ah, no can do, love. I have to paint the man cave. Husqvarna Auto Mower. Never mow again. Learn more at husqvarna.ie. First up, a Go Loud original from News Talk. Get all the news you need to start your day with First Up, the podcast that brings you stories, analysis, and interviews with the top newsmakers. First Up, available each weekday morning from 7 a.m. on Go Loud. Subscribe to this podcast for free on the Go Loud app. OTB AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. 13 minutes past nine this morning here on OTB AM. We'd love to hear from you. 87 180 180 is the WhatsApp number. If you want to get in touch, or of course, you can always uh, leave us a comment on YouTube or use the hashtag OTBAM. Nathan Murphy, good morning to you. How are you? Morning, lads. So, uh, did you say up? to What time did it finish? I did. I did. It finished about half one uh, when Louis Westhazen went up the 18th and couldn't hold his eagle approach shot to bring it to a playoff. And John Ram could probably start celebrating. So it was a late all night, a long weekend, but well worth it. Worth it because the final... The final nine holes on the Sunday seems to have brought a lot of drama. I didn't stay up to watch it, so I've just been reading reports this morning where it seems like everybody kind of circled and just around the turn, 
a bunch of people still had it within their gift to win this thing, and then that's kind of what you want, really. Uh, it was one of the most exciting final rounds of a major that I can remember. Uh, maybe let's go through the various contenders before we get to the brilliance of John Ram, because the front nine set up this sensational leaderboard where at one stage you had every member of the world's top five, plus Rory McIlroy, plus Brooks Kepka, all inside the top eight of the tournament. That's what we were had heading into the final couple of hours. And then one by one, with the exception of John Ram, they all just fell apart with really varying degrees of calamity. We had Bryson DeChambeau, the defending champion, an inch, an inch from a hole in one on the eighth. He led the tournament on his own, and he has this disastrous back nine, bogey at 11, bogey at 12. Then he slips on the 13th tee, sends his drive well right. He wasn't the only player to slip on the 13th tee, whatever they had done in that new tee box. Uh, but Bryson never recovered from there. A double bogey on 13, a quadruple bogey eight at the 17. Uh, back nine of 44 killed Bryson's chances. And he was the favorite uh, as we went into the back nine. He was leading the tournament on his own. So a disaster for Bryson DeChambeau. Brooks Kepka, his arch nemesis, is right there as well. At one stage, we dreamed of maybe a Brooks Bryson playoff. Brooks had chances to get in the house on five under par, which was ultimately the winning score. I just couldn't hold a putty bogeyed 16 and 18. He ends up dropping out of contention. Colin Marikawa, who won the PGA last year inside the world's top five, he made a mess of the 13th as well. Double bogey there, killed his chances. We had Mackenzie Hughes, a Canadian. He's the world number 67. He was the overnight leader. He got his ball stuck up a tree at the 10th hole <laughs> when he is right in contention. He's only two shots off the lead. The ball didn't even go straight into the tree. It bounced on a cart path and then landed in the tree. And we have this bizarre scenario where all the American supporters, with a few on them, are shouting and chanting, shake that tree, shake that tree, shake that tree. But nobody shook the tree and the ball stood up there and he had to take a drop. And that was the end of poor old Mackenzie Hughes. Uh, a couple of minutes after that, a spectator ran onto the 13th fairway, not wearing a huge amount of clothes, took out a couple of balls, golf balls. His own. Dropped them, dropped them on the fairway. I had a similar hairstyle tone, I think. Uh, okay. Dropped the balls in the middle of the fairway. Took a couple of swings uh, before, I presume, promptly being Shot. arrested. <laughs> uh, he kind of ran into just the security guards. He, he, he did. He was uh, looking for um, a bit of solace from them and hoping to God that he wouldn't be shot. So there was this <laughs> massive element of madness on the back nine. Uh, we had Louis Westhazen, who even when John Ram held his putt on 18 and was celebrating like a man who had won, Louis Westhazen is still only a shot back. He has two holes left to play, 17 and 18. 18 is a par five, so you're thinking there's no reason he can't birdie 18 and force this into a playoff. Inexplicably, for the man with the smoothest swing in golf, goes out of bounds with his tee shot on 17, manages to rescue a bogey, so he needs to eagle 18, which isn't beyond the realms of possibility. Hits a poor tee shot again, and then bizarrely lays up and has to hold his eagle approach, uh, which he never really looked like doing. So that was the end of Louis Westhazen. Sixth time as runner-up in a major for Louis Westhazen. He has won. He won the Open at St. Andrews in 2010, but six times now as a runner-up, and he'll have massive regrets. And then there's Rory McIlroy, who gave himself a, a brilliant chance, tied for the lead as we went into the back nine, had a really solid front nine, put it well, pulled this massive birdie putt on the fourth hole, he felt that the momentum was with him, but he just couldn't maintain the pressure. Had a bad bogey at 11. He three-putted, particularly the par putt. Uh, just never gave it a chance uh, from short range. And then he made a complete mess of 12. Went in the bunker off the tee, then went into another bunker on the side of the green, but had this horrible, horrible lie, plugged downhill, shanks it. Nothing he can really do, just shanks it 20 yards to his right into this deep rough, ends up taking a double bogey and really left himself with too much to do from from there on in but the first time incredibly really in the last seven years since Rory last won a major that he has put himself in contention in a back nine he did play in the final pairing at the Masters the year Patrick Reed won but was really out of it by the time he got into the back nine but there were chances there and his attitude seemed spot on his putting particularly his lag putting uh, at the start of the round was excellent his iron play was as good as we've seen in recent times so until those last 11 12 holes when his putting just started to frustrate him he was a big big presence in this and the work that he's doing with Barbara Tella and he's doing with Pete Cowan 
seems to be bearing fruit and we just hope now that he can kick on into the Open Championship uh, in a couple of weeks' time. So a lot to be positive about, about McElroy, but like, I have gone through a lot of contenders there that a lot of bad things happen to on that back nine. And for all that to be happening in the space of a couple of hours just made it uh, such brilliant TV. So, so what did John Ram do right then? Steady. Steady as she goes. Uh, had a massive, massive stroke of luck on the ninth hole when... He hit his tee shot out of bounds and went over this perimeter fence and it looked as though he was going to have to take a drop. But nobody could quite believe it. The perimeter fence was seen as a temporary structure, got a free drop on the ninth, took full advantage, ends up birdieing that hole. He couldn't quite believe it himself, he said afterwards, was fully expecting that his ball was gone and he would have to maybe go back and reload on the tee. And as all those other players were having disastrous moments, he just played solid golf, par after par after par, and then had the two moments, had the two stardust moments that you dream about as a player on 17 and 18, hold two wonderful birdie putts on 17, I think it was 24 feet, and at about eight foot of break from left to right, straight in the middle of the hole, and did the exact same thing again on the 18th. Got him in the house on five under, put all the pressure on... Louis Westhazen and a fully, fully deserving winner of this tournament. And I don't think anybody who watches golf is in any way surprised that John Ram has ended up in this position. And, and the roar, Nathan, as well at 17 and 18, a proper major feel to the roar from the crowd at, at, at those moments. Like it, It's interesting watching him speak afterwards, talking about the positive mindset that allowed him to get through these last couple of weeks that have been quite difficult. I assume a positive mindset is much easier after you've won uh, the US Open, in fairness. But it does seem that this guy has developed a little bit as, as an individual over the last little while, like previously described himself as a bottle of soda that's been shaken and ready to explode. Has he changed that a little bit over the last little while? Certainly does seem that way. Now he has matured. You would expect him uh, to mature like anybody that maybe some of that uh, angst that was there when he was a bit younger he has managed to moderate a little bit. He's 26 now. He's a father uh, in the last few weeks as well. But I think that red-hot passion still runs in there at times as well, and that, that's what makes him so good. But he had that stroke of luck, and then he just held his composure. At times, there were putts that lips out. There were things that weren't going his way, but he just never dropped his head. So unquestionably, I think he has added that to his game. But like this... As I say, for John Ram, if you look back at his career, it's no surprise that he's ended up as a major champion. He was the world number one amateur for longer than anybody has been the world number one amateur when he was at Arizona State. He was incredibly highly tipped by everybody. Tim Mickelson, who was Phil Mickelson's brother, now Phil Mickelson's caddy, was his coach at Arizona State. He left that job to go and become John Ram's agent. Such was his confidence. In fact, there's a great story of Phil Mickelson predicting greatness for John Ram all the way back in 2016 when Ram was still an amateur at the uh, St. Jude Classic of 2016, a tournament maybe not massively remembered. There was a, a weather break and Phil Mickelson found himself in having a bite to eat with Colt Nost, who was another former PGA Tour player. And they got talking about John Ram, who is still an amateur at this stage. And Mickelson said, this guy is going to be a top 10 player in the world inside a year. And uh, Colt Nost laughed at Phil Mickelson, said, this simply is impossible. They went through it and... Uh, looked at the numbers and said, really, to go from an amateur with no world ranking to the top 10 is an impossibility. You would have to do miraculous things for that to happen. Uh, Phil Mickelson, as is his way, offered a bet. And when Phil bets, it's usually a substantial bet. Uh, Colt Nose gave him odds of 2-1 to one that John Ram two wouldn't to be one. able to do this. 2-1 to one that John Ram That's wouldn't be able tight. to do this. I wouldn't. Uh, Dust Dustin Johnson was in the room as well. And DJ, it took DJ a long time to get to the top 10 in the world, despite winning PGA Tour events. So they said, like, this... Remember, you're going from, you're starting out at what, about 1800th in the world, usually when you get onto the world rankings, to go from there to top 10 in a year. So this is the St. Jude Classic. A week later, John Ram plays the US Open. Doesn't make the cup, but is a low amateur. That's his final tournament as an amateur. A week after that, plays the Quicken Loans National. Leads after the first two rounds. Ends up finishing third. Gets a few more invites. A couple of weeks later, finishes second at the Canadian Open. Suddenly, he has his card. Six months after that, he's at Torrey Pines, where he won last night holds this 60-footer for Eagle from the back of the green to win the Farmers Insurance Open at Torrey Pines, his first PGA Tour event, and then for the next six months is consistently inside the top 10. And I think with a fortnight to go, ends up in the top 10 in the world and proves 
Phil Mickelson right. And Phil Mickelson was there last night. Uh, you would have seen at the back of the driving range when Ram was just hitting a couple of shots, just in clay, case it went to a playoff. So the Mickelsons and the Rams are, are very, very close together. Tim Mickelson uh, took him under his wing when he went to Arizona State. Had very little English by all accounts when he moved to America. It's a story that he learned his English by listening to a lot of hip hop, listening to a lot of Kendrick Lamar and Eminem and having moved from the Basque country. <laughs> Uh, that that is basically how he learned his English. So to go from there to be the world number one amateur to now being the world number one player who has won at golf courses everywhere and anywhere. We know he's won at Port Stewart, at La Hinch. He's a two-time Irish Open champion. He's won his home tournament, the Spanish Open twice. He's won the Dubai World Championship on a couple of occasions. He's won several t- events now in the PGA yeah. Tour. He is a fully deserving world number one and a fully deserving major winner and somebody who is going to win many, many more of them. If it was going on any longer, you would have been like, he would have had the title, oh, best player in the world, not to have won a major. But no one mm. ever bothered talking about that really with him because we all knew it was going to come at some point. Uh, Richard Redball says on YouTube, West Hazen should have his card revoked for laying up. <laughs> yeah, now, looking from afar, it looked a bizarre decision considering what was at stake. You could hear he was having a long conversation with his caddy, Colin Byrne, who you know, has been in this position before as well, has won a major championship with Retief Goosen. And he was in the left rough. The shot looked to be maybe to try and hit into the bunker at the side of 18 and try and hole out from there. He clearly felt he couldn't get enough on the ball uh, to make sure it wouldn't go back in the water or wouldn't go way over the back of the green. But I think at that stage, and the fact that it was Louis Westhazen who says, come second on so many occasions, and a feeling that quite often when he's come second, he hasn't taken enough risks. I, yeah, I, was, I, could, I honestly couldn't believe at the time that he didn't just go for it because the chances of holding out from, I think he had 69 yards left to hole out. No, it, it never looked like it was going to happen. So, yeah, very disappointing from West Hazen. Uh Okay. If you um, were to look back on this then, Ram expected he was the favourite. Obviously, what happened a couple of weeks ago when he was going to win a tournament and they told him on the 18th green that he had COVID or tested positive for it. Uh, he, he dealt with that whole situation very well, it seems. And he talked about karma being, he was a big believer in it and he thought something good was going to happen for him. So that's that, and it was, it's one of those very rare occasions in golf where you're like, very obvious that he was going to win this and he did, he followed through on it, which means there's a lot of pressure on him because we all expected, he must have expected it too. From McElroy's perspective, you think things are trending in the right direction and he's, he's relevant again when it comes to conversations around the majors from this point forward, if he can build on this? Well, in his last four tournaments now, he's had a win at Quail Hollow and he's contended in a major and he's obviously doing a huge amount of work in the background with Pete Cowan. Like Rory came into this tournament completely under the radar. We had no idea what he was doing uh, in terms of practice with Pete Cowan. He emerged out on course and Everton pretty much looked right. There were signs of a two-way miss maybe earlier in the tournament, but when the pressure was on, by and large, he was able to hold up yesterday. It was just his putting at times. Even when Deschambeau had that almost hole in one. I know McElroy doesn't even know what happened, but straight away the camera went to McElroy with a birdie putt on seven and he'd been so good with his putting up to that. It was about 12 feet away and he just left it to the right and that was a moment where the pressure was really on his putting and he couldn't hold it. So that'll be disappointing for him. But as I say, for him not to be in contention really for a major for seven years and now to be right there in the back nine is definitely signs of progress. The difficulty for McElroy is he's in that echelon of players where majors are really all that matters. Yes, we can get excited about FedEx Cup and regular tour events. We love to see him win at Quail Hollow. But it's such a condensed season that if he doesn't win at Royal St. George, and he's won an Open Championship before, uh, so there's no reason why he can't go and contend on a Lynx course. But if he doesn't win there, he's got eight months again before the Masters and the talk of the career Grand Slam starts once again. And like maybe those eight months see Rory go and become the dominant force in golf and he wins three or four tournaments and it's just a matter of getting to Augusta with his game in the right shape. But yeah. we've seen in Rory's career, so much seems to change every three to six months. Uh, it's a bit of a roller coaster that every time there's momentum, it seems to go away. We go into crisis, he tries something different and you just love to see him play steady, solid golf for the next six to eight months, win some tournaments, stay in contention, and just don't do anything dramatic on or off the course. Okay, we should mention Leona Maguire had a brilliant week as well. Oh, yeah, unbelievable. Uh, you know, we've never had an Irish winner on the LPGA Tour, and for a long time it looked like she might 
change that last night. Uh, she was within a shot of the lead going down the 18th. Had an eagle putt on 18 from about 25 feet. If she'd hold it, she may have won the tournament. She definitely would have ended up in a playoff. Didn't quite happen for her, but she's been consistently in the top 10 now over the last few months. She's still a rookie, remember, on the, PGA, on the LPGA Tour. And she's been around for so long. Think of her at the Solheim Cup a decade ago now, Killeen Castle, uh, there on the junior Solheim Cup team. And everybody at that stage, expected her to go on to superstardom. She took her own path. She went to college. She became one of the great college players in America. And this is still her first proper season on the main LPGA Tour. She's going to keep her card. She's going to the Olympics. She's probably going to end up on the Solheim Cup team this year. And there's a major this coming week on the LPGA. And the way she's playing, you wouldn't be at all surprised if she got herself in contention. What is the plan with Golf Weekly this week? Uh, we have our review pod uh, later this afternoon, we'll have another pod later in the week. We're going to be talking to Mark Brody. He's uh, the nerd who came up with strokes gained, which is probably the most important invention in golf over the last decade. So that's coming up in a little while. We had our watch along last night with Gary Murphy and uh, Peter Laurie ahead of the final round. I think we had about three podcasts last week as well. So it's uh, more of that good stuff to come your way, Jer. All that good value available for uh, just three ninety nine. Get onto the patreon.com forward slash golf weekly or otvsports.com forward slash golf weekly. It'll take you to the Patreon as well. If I was to ask you if you could get a shout out from any individual sports person in the world, who would it be? Who would you pick? Like on, on Cameo? Yeah, I mean... Oh, there's, uh, there's a website for this. Um, who would I scroll through and pick? Uh, I'd, love, I'd love one of those Ray Parler shout outs. He does them on Twitter, actually. Don't, don't, even, need to, don't even need to go to Cameo for Parler. Roy Keane. And, and mean, for him to really mean it. Did you see the Roy Keane Father's Day card that was doing the rounds? No. It was like Father's Day, doing your job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Colin Bowie's mates organised something pretty impressive for him. Have a look. Hey, Colin. This is uh, Nick Kyrgios here. I just want to address this message to the most famous journalist in Ireland. Uh, I just want to say uh, I appreciate all the support. Um, you're one of my favourite off-the-ball presenters. Um, all I want to say is just, I hope you have an amazing day. Um, they tell me to talk a bit of shit, but I just want to say, I hope you uh, keep doing you, have fun, and I'll be here if you need any advice. Take it easy, boss. <laughs> keep doing you. That is the last thing Buhig needs to hear. <laughs> one, one of uh, my favourite off-the-ball presenters. Mm, don't one of do not do not uh, search Nick Kyrgios Colin Buhig into uh, YouTube is all I'll say Nick uh, he's obviously watching <laughs> this morning um, oh really yeah Nick Nick's a Golf Weekly subscriber is he <laughs> no no strange things happen yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not I hope not why has, has Buhig had a go at Kyrgios previously I thought he was I think he actually kind of loves him doesn't he yeah wasn't that it, like that's uh, anyway Right. Uh, Nathan, good stuff. Thanks very much. Thanks, lads. Well done. Tommy Rooney's with us. Tommy, good morning to you. How are you? Hi, Chaps. How are we? Why are you here? You're not well, talking Jeremy, about Mead. Doing... You're not talking no. about Mead. No Mead. We're not talking about Mead. I'm, I'm banned talking about Mead, and I'm sick of it too. Jerry, we're doing the 170 kilometres my way for the Ring of Car Charity cycle, aren't we? 170? I thought it was 100, and I thought I had loads of time left. Oh, jeez. Yeah, I know. I've, I've done 20. How does that... How, You've how, done 20? Yeah. Okay. That's not bad. How but, many legs are you doing in it? Well, I was going to do 20 a day for the next five days and think that's me grand, but it turns out... So you've got to have this done by the end of the month. Uh, the, the Ring of Kerry charity cycle, it can be done virtually this year. It's running from the 3rd of June until the 3rd of July. So 3rd of July. I have plenty of time. I have plenty of time. I need a deadline in my life. You've given me yeah. a deadline. of uh, 12... Yeah. 13 days. Oh, and how are you getting on? Oh, so, so good. So, so good. Yeah, I am. Uh, Did you buy a I, bike yet? I could, I could swim the, I could swim the Ring of Kerry at this stage and uh, I'm so, my second so good. Um, I do have a bike, actually, yeah. Yeah, right. I, bike. You really got into your training around the, was it the triathlon two years ago? You were going up and down the, the prom in Clontarf, on. Yeah, and then I went to a music festival. I've spent a lot of time in Barcelona, and that, that didn't go so well. No, it is not my thing, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, how are you guys getting on? <laughs> yeah, well, look, look, I hopped on the bike yesterday. It had been sitting in the shed all, all winter. It got sorted, uh, got it touched up in the bike store. I hopped on it, 
and I kept cycling and I am bloody feeling it this morning. Uh, top of the hamstrings are in a bad way. So uh, I don't know when I'm going to hop back on the bike there, but I had tried to do it in three legs. I did 60 kilometers yesterday. Whoa. At the back of the bird. Yeah, I, I hadn't planned that. I just kept going. And uh, it's it's addictive when you're when That's you're moving. Brilliant. and You know, the bike, you've got a decent bike and yeah. you're able to keep going. So um, best of luck. You've uh, a bit of bit of catching up to do yeah don't worry I'll, I'll catch you just like i tracked down owen and the and not, not that we bring it up that often on the triathlon that time but the, the look of disgust on his face as like as the old man with the coagulated blood caught up with him yeah cycling's yeah. your thing though you're good at it you, you were flying in the duathlon that we did last summer uh, tommy all this buttering up it's uh I'm, I'm not used to it so something must be going on he must be about to unleash a full hour-long mead special about what no, went wrong no no Tommy, good stuff. When is the um, football pod out this week? Uh, episode 7 is going to be out on Wednesday, uh, hopefully early on Wednesday. And uh, yeah, there's plenty to look forward to the start of the championship this week. We're going to be talking about one of the greatest games of the decade in the 2010s, the Dublin Kerry All-Ireland semi-final in 2013. Owen oh, Sheehan, I know you cried about that game, so sorry for bringing it up. Um, We've got a good classic game club on that, actually. You can go back and watch it on YouTube as well, just to prime yourself for, uh, for better analysis. That's, that's how I knew you cried. You were talking about it that day. I think you're at Electric Picnic watching it, were you? <laughs> oh yeah, sorry. This is actually this is actually fully true. I thought you were only joking. Oh no, I actually oh. did. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. My, uh, oh, my, wow. my my friends found me at the main stage with uh, a bottle of wine. Weirdly, class is forbidden from being brought into the main arena, but I'd somehow uh, sourced a bottle of wine between uh, the Kerry game and find my way to the main stage where. And you were literally in tears. Yeah. No, no. Actually, no. My friend says that there was like they went, came over and found me, and there was just like one singular tear. Going down my cheek. Well, we don't have time for me to tell you my story of uh, getting started on after Mead and Loud uh, Leinster final. I was at Oxygen 2010. I stupidly wore my Mead jersey back to camp, which I shouldn't have done. We'll tell you that another day. Shouldn't be. Shouldn't be a reason for getting started on. No, so. it shouldn't. The anger is on. The anger is on. Right. 9.37 this morning. Tommy, good stuff. Thanks very much for that. The uh, Ring of Kerry charity cycle. You can do it virtually. 170 kilometres and uh, go to ringofkerrycycle.ie to sign up. Runs until the 3rd of July. OTBAM brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. We're back tomorrow from half past seven on OTBAM. I'm going to play out with a bit of Mario Rosenstock with John Duggan. First, though, here's Paddy Andrews and Andy Moore and discussing Dublin's ability just to manage games on episode six of the Football Pod. New episode coming your way on Wednesday. Subscribe. The Dubs versus Donegal last week was textbook dubs under Jim Gavin. Keeping the opposition at arm's length, doing just enough. What are those games like for the players? And do you ever believe you're in trouble in the middle of those games, Paddy? So you were on OTBAM earlier in the week and we had meant to get to this with you. Do you ever feel like you're in trouble in those games where maybe, you know, with the other team is in and around you, there's a couple of points either way and next thing you just see Dublin, whether it's after the, the, the water break or just before half time, there's a five minute period where they just take over. Yeah, and, and it, I suppose you can look over the last four or five years, it, it seems to be a similar pattern with Dublin where you could say 65 minutes of the game, they're kind of, and Andy, you touched on it, even, or a couple of the league games we were doing, it looks like they're in third gear, but they're in total control. That, that They know what they're doing there. That they Everyone in their, their their team is experienced, and you're talking from Pluxton and Goal to Fitzsimons, the full back line, Fenton, McCarthy around the middle, Scully, Khan, Kieran up front, everyone on that team knows exactly what's required at that exact moment in the game. So like Gal or Donegal gets it's kind of five all at six all and they're kind of cruising the numbers. Donegal are in it. But Dublin are just waiting. Mm. They, they'll know there's a period where Donegal are going to switch off or Dublin might win a couple of kickouts off them, win some of Patton's kickouts or they turn over a defender coming out of defense and then everyone knows let's go for the juggler here. Let's kill them here. That, and, and you do, and in the blink of an eye, how many times, like you're saying, have you seen over four or five years that in the space of three minutes, Dublin score one three or one four, or they score two two, and then for the rest of the rest of the half, for the next twenty minutes, it's just back to control, keep the ball. But that's that's what what we're talking about. That's the decision making and things like that. So Dublin are more than happy to, to what may be perceived as be kind of monotonous or boring style of play because they know there'll be a period here for two or three minutes where everyone on the pitch is communicating. These guys are rattled here. Let's kill them now. And you can see the start of the second half, it's four points at half time. And then in the space of three minutes, they rattle off three points from play. They push right up on the kick out. 
Um, Sean McMahon kicks a point. Fenta kicks a point. Kieran kicks a point. And in the blink of an eye, Bernie Gall would have come out for the start of that second half going, right, we need a quick start here. Let's get it back in the game. And within three minutes, Dublin are now seven points up. And for the rest of that, the rest of the game was an odd event. 30 minutes, Dublin just go back and they'll keep the ball for five minutes. Well, keep I it don't... for five minutes. And, and, and the opposition, the, there's no momentum for the opposition. Yeah. Dublin are controlling the game. And that's, that's what I'm talking about. Decision making and just being aware, okay, they're vulnerable now, let's kill them. What and I don't go back and just keep the ball. What I don't understand about O'Paddy is that you look at the likes of Donegal, we made the mistake over the years, uh, Kerry made the mistake in 2019, is that players try to play Dub- like try to be better than Dublin at their own game, right? So you, you look at Dublin, they hold the ball for so long, you're going to spend a lot of your time without the football. Um, and they don't seem to have any strategy about it. And what, I, what seems to happen is Dublin definitely target just before half time, they definitely target uh, just after half time. And teams genuinely run out of energy. So if you look at it, right, and we're on about... Do you know what, Andy? On that, we we actually don't. (laughs) It's not a specific time in the game. It's it's just the players will recognise. And that might be 10 minutes into the first Mm -hmm. half. It's not, oh, here's the the first quarter or the second quarter. It might just be, there'll be a moment where everyone realises these guys are struggling. They can't win their own kick out. And then everyone's like, right, everyone just push forward here. Let's box them in and let's let's win this game here. It's not a set time. It's it's just you're aware the players are aware of it on the pitch. And, and is that soul crushing? Will sense it. Andy, is that soul crushing? Yeah, yeah. I have a vision from from watching the Donegal Dublin game Saturday evening. I have a vision from it. It's just James McCarthy catching the ball, gathering the ball in the 21 and just sprinting. And Donegal boys just looked out on their feet. And he's just running. And all of a sudden, he's at the 55-yard <laughs> line. And Donegal haven't retreated, haven't got themselves into a good position. And all of a sudden, Dublin are in complete... Like, you can just see the control. And in that period, we were on about shot efficiency over the last couple of weeks. Mm. Right? Like, Freerty kicks the ball into the keeper's hands. Kilkenny gets a point. This is just before half time when <laughs> it's 6-5 to, it's 6-5 to Donegal at the time. But Freerty takes a shot, drops it short. No support. He had to take the shot on. Drops it short. Kilkenny gets the score. O'Donnell kicks the next wide under pressure. He's falling. He lands on the floor and he kicks it. Khan gets a fisted point after it. Okay. Then there's a kick pass intercepted by uh, by um, uh, by uh, by Merchant. He intercepts it. Khan gets a free just on top of the D. Costo kicks it. And then Langan, which was the biggest visual for me, is running through the box. This is what I'm saying about teams running out of energy. Langan is running through. He's on the top of the D. And literally, lads, has no support. Like, there's no one around him. Ryan McHugh tries to get there. Dublin turned the ball over. Boom. It's a goal. And in the space of literally four minutes, it's 6-5 to Donegal. They seem like they're in the game. I feel in that moment, like everybody else, like what happened to me all last year in the all Ireland final, happened to Kerry in 2019 in the all Ireland final in the second half. They're literally, the legs are gone. And... Johnny Gawler won 8 5 down, and as Paddy said, come out after the game, hold on to the ball for two minutes. My fan scores a, a point from a pass from Scully, yeah, brilliant from pass. a different planet. Turnover the, from the resulting kick out, Fenton kicks the score. Turnover from the resulting kick out, Kilkenny gets the score. It's one, what is it, 110 to seven points after 40 minutes. And Watch and repeat. 111 to seven points. And it's, that's it, lads. It's, I know it finishes quite well for Donegal, but that's it. The game is over. It's 40 minutes gone, and there's no way back. So when, there, when you're in that vortex, when you know you feel like the, the control, the, the grip of the dubs is coming around your neck when you're a part of that team, <laughs> like, what does that feel like? What, what, why, why are they sucking the energy out of teams so well? How are they doing that? I'll give an example because it, it's funny. We used to play the, uh, everyone at the A's and B games. I think uh, so. Dublin, we played kind of training games. You were surely always on the A team, were you? Uh, for a very <laughs> too brief a period. But at the end of my career, I was on the B team, right? So, who you be marking? Uh, I'd mark a Fitzy or someone like this. It's a complete shambles. Thing. So, um, <laughs> but anyway, we, we go out, right? So, the teams would be there. And if Andy, you'll notice this, every inter county player, every club player can relate to this. You're not in the starting 15. So, you go out and you play a 20 minute or 30 minute match or whatever it is. And you're riled up. You're looking around going, I'm gonna show the coach and I'm gonna I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna shoot the lights out here and show them that I should be in the team. So we play these A's and B games. And there'd be seven or eight of us in that bracket, you know, Michael Air McCauley, Kev Mack, all these guys. And we're like, right, lads, come on, let's get stuck into them from the start. And you're playing the Dublin, the first 15. But they know that. They know that that's our mindset. So the ball is thrown in. 
in this training game and we're ready to run through brick walls and say Fenton wins the kicker. Dublin, the A team will just keep the ball for four minutes, four or five minutes just to piss us off because <laughs> they, they know what we're trying to do and we're running around like uh, trying to get tackles on and McCarthy will pop it to someone else and Scully will have it and he'll be taking the bank out of lads. Not in a bad, but just they, mm, yeah. they know where they're done, they're controlling it and in the space of five minutes by the end of it they'll pop it if they work it to someone and Khan scores a goal or something. And we're there. The wind in our sails is gone like that. That's control. But it's also, like, it's a really experienced team. And you, you can't get away from it. Like, the guys there have seven, eight all Ireland medals. They've been doing this for eight or nine mm-hmm. years. They've seen, they've played the best, best teams. They've played Division One for 10 years. There's a huge experience and knowledge bank there that Dublin have built up over the years. You know, and, and you can see... If you look at the improvement, I would say from Kerry and their their play last year, where they had no attacking game plan, and that Clifford is doing a shame what trying to four shots against Cork. Look how much they've improved in the space of six months. Where now Clifford doesn't force anything. He's, if he shots on, he'll take it. If not, he'll pass it to someone else. And their their hold are way more fluid. That's them just getting experience and game intelligence. And it takes time to do that. So Dublin have that, but it's also the way they're coached and and, and the players themselves. Kind of taking that responsibility. It's it's remember playing those A's and B games. It's horrendous. Did, did you ever Jesus Christ. in in the last couple of years? Did you ever have a massive performance in one of those A versus B games? <laughs> All too rare, I'm afraid. <laughs> I used to did, did you ever come off point. one of them going? I'm back in. I'm I, back I, in. No, I, I, the odd time, yeah. But by the by the end, by by last season, now <laughs> I knew myself. I was finished. Desi didn't need to tell me anything. What were the, <laughs> the what, were the Mayo A versus B games at the same level, Andy? They were, but we would play a completely different style of football. Uh, like with Dublin, we we would try to disturb them as much as we could, and we would mm. try to make it as chaotic as we could playing Dublin. Mm. Um, but they've got better at it over the years. Um, they've just got so much better at it. Like, yeah, it is, and it, it like so. If you look at the 2017-16 finals, you're seeing lots of the ball in the first half. You're playing really, but then you could go. It could be four. You look up at the clock. Like, and it's 42 minutes gone and the ball hasn't come up. So you're in a position there. Do I stick or do I twist? Do I keep high up the field to keep the Dublin team stretched with nobody inside me inside 45 yards, just myself and Johnny Cooper, Fitzsimons up there? Or do you go and try to look for the ball? So you could spend five or six minutes. So every ball you get then is the second half. This is what I'm so intrigued by, by tactics. I'm so intrigued as, okay, Dublin are going to do this to us. So what can we do different? I remember McGuinness in 2012, played Cork, and he played all out attack in the first half, and then he played all out defence. Like he, he threw, <laughs> he threw Cork, he threw that Cork team completely, and he just ran, they ran them out the gate, but they just conserved energy, conserved energy, conserved energy, and then when they came out, bang, they blew them away, and it was just, it was amazing to see. And I just don't think there's enough real high level thinking. On what 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 they're trying to do, and I think that's why Rochford, in fairness to him, troubled Dublin in 2016 and 17 because he wasn't afraid to make a decision. So if you look at the Robbie Henley decision for the 2016 final, that was done to try to win the game. It wasn't tried to done. It wasn't done to try to do anything else or hold Dublin or keep us close mm-hmm. in the game. It was done to try to win the game and disturb Dublin. Aidan O'Shea to full back against uh, Kerry. Kerry in 2017. Sorry, yeah. That was done as a change, as a difference, and. I, I can't see why managers now are not thinking, okay, we're going to do this now, and then we come on, let's throw something at them here. Can I ask you a question about Rochford and that? That I, I, I'm, I'm hoping I remember this right. Was there a game against Tyrone where he pulled a fast one oh, yeah. and he started Alan Dillon, and then Mickey Hart makes a switch to try and counteract the influence of Alan mm-hmm. Dillon, and Rochford brings on Barry Moran, and Mickey Hart's switch is completely nullified because Dillon's been whipped off. He's done his job for 25, 30 minutes. Am I remembering that right? Was that an All yeah, Ireland? Yeah, there was an All Ireland um, quarter final, I think, in sixteen. And Dillo that was, was genius. Yeah, Dillo was like Dillo was. He was finishing up. We all knew he was finishing up. But he, he used to do little moments at, at at in training, like where you think, oh, he might. <laughs> and then he held him and didn't play him. And I know Dillo, right competitor, was probably frustrated. But then just had a word, played him. Paddy has mentioned the false nine a few times, but literally played him as a false nine or a ten, a soccer ten, and what. Uh, Tyrone used to do they used to play Colin Kavanagh who used to sit back as we've analysed quite a bit over the last couple of weeks but they used to also play Justin McMahon at six so not only used to have one holder they used to have two holders in that so Rochford released Dylan as a ball player kind of third midfielder out there and it 
it just opened them up for the first half. And then, as you said, the pull Justin after 25. Uh, I think Colin Cavanaugh might, or someone else went, went shortly after him. Then Rochford pulled Dylan at, at half time yeah. and somebody else. And it, it just kind of changed. I just, oh, we still needed two unbelievable points from. Uh, from Lee Keegan to win the game first, but it definitely um, it definitely made the an impact on them because they were probably at that stage they were probably a better team than us, but it definitely it stalled them and made them think and made them change and it worked out well for us. So you, when you're creating chaos, does anything work of, of breaking the the double momentum when they have that grip? Because I I've I've seen very few teams actually break the grip. Kerry obviously in '19 at times in that first game were able to do it. Paddy, did Anthem work against you when you're in that stage? I'll tell you now, the most important thing for, for, for the whole National League, we've had, what, four games over the last five weeks. Kerry in the third quarter in Perlis, there was, they got momentum on Dublin. I think it was the outscored, it was eight points to a goal. I think Costello got a penalty, but, but that very rarely happens to Dublin where they lose that kind of control and, and teams get a run on them. And for, for Dublin... That's what they will look at from the National League. They won't look at the Donegal game is nonsense, the, the Roscom game is nonsense, the Galway game, they're, they're irrelevant. They look at, okay, what did we do wrong here? How did Kerry get a run on us? Why did Paul Murphy score a couple of points? Why was Clifford getting free all of a sudden? And we mm. lost control of that game in that moment. So that's what they'll take from that. And they'll learn the lessons, and I'm sure they've been reviewing that part. Uh, and the same with Peter Keane. Like if you think at that stage Dublin were seven points up, like they were on on on, on Saturday night against Donegal, and I remember I was at the game thinking, "This is it. This could be this could be ten or twelve points, and, and Kerry are in a hole." And they turned it around. So both teams, for Peter Keane and for Kerry, they look at what did we do right in that section of the game. They're not going to be looking at the, the Galway game and Tralee or anything like that. That's what we always said at the start. That those two teams weren't worried or concerned about winning the National League. They wanted to find a couple of players and they wanted to find a style that, that maximised their potential. And that that quarter will be a huge learning point for both of those teams. Um, and, and it's kind of who adapts to that better. That's, that, 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 that's unreal. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's, that's great insights. Uh, but like, for us, what we did was we identified that this was going to happen. So we identified that Dublin are going to come out, they're going to try to control the game, they're going to try to hold the ball, and what are we going to do? To go, so are we going to sit back? We didn't really do anything as such, but we at least identified that Dublin are going to try to come out and control the game just after half time. and how are we going to... And if it does happen for 10 minutes, let's not panic, let's just sit in, keep the scoreline uh, nice and steady, and then kind of try to... To double back on that, and we did but, in a way with Lee's. But and, and the, the reason why, why you guys would have been successful to a point and kind of challenge of Dublin was you, you had the experience to, to go and do that. And that, that we, in our very first pod, when we're talking about previewing the season in the National League, this is what I'm talking about that it takes teams, it takes players, and it takes coaches time to, to experience this, to mm. understand. And what worked for Mayo might not work for for Tyrone or work for Donegal or look what Peter Keane thought last season might work for Donegal clearly didn't work for Kerry against Cork so that takes time that's what we're talking about a betting in period for coaches for for Parlick there with Galway for for Logan and Dewar with Tyrone and, and they would have taken serious lessons from from Saturday night themselves in, in Killarney it takes time to find what is my team comfortable with playing what, what suits the players best then you're looking to go, okay, what do Dublin do or what do Kerry do or what do the top teams do? How does, how can I develop a game plan and tactics that will suit my group of players that will counteract that? And it's difficult. That, that's that's where the coaches get the big books. That's where they're the managers. They, they need to figure that out. And, and, and like I say, there's no point in Andy going, well, this is what Mayo did. And going, well, Mayo had unbelievably athletic players. They yes. had experience. They were hard. Uh, does that suit Dudley Gold's team where they're, a lot younger by Michael Murphy and say and Ryan McHugh and they're, they're, they like to play more on the front foot or those Tyrone style of play you've seen Tyrone have tried to change their style of play and it's been a, like Saturday night was a catastrophe for it so yeah. this is what takes time and we're talking about experience we're talking about coaches we're talking about implementing their style of play that is the challenge that's the role that the manager and the coaches you know they get caught up in all the fancy stuff there, there, there's some basics that need to be sorted first before getting into that what I'm hearing from you is that 12 minutes after half time in Dublin Kerry and Semple is the most important 12 minutes of the National Football League so far. So football in 2021. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go back and watch if, that a few times. If that was me, I'd be looking at that. 
think this is going to be fascinating tonight, John. Really, really fascinating. This is the first time in a long time that Rory has put himself into real contention for a major. Not just coming from behind or coming from you know where he's not in, in contention anymore and he actually finishes fifth or sixth. This is he's on he's in now. He's in the square now tonight. He's on the focus is on him tonight and it's on Bryson um as well. And there's you know John Ram is up there as well. It's going to be brilliant. But really John, I really wish Rory would shut up before majors and just says what Tiger says. I'm here to win. That's it. Because no matter what Rory says he gets himself painted into a complete psychological corner. His latest psychological corner in this US Open is, I'm playing with no pressure, the pressure's off. So now he's playing with the pressure off. But if you analyze that carefully, you'll find that the pressure being off, the pressure of thinking that the pressure is off is even greater pressure than when the <laughs> pressure is on. Think about it. If you say to yourself, I'll say to them that I'm playing with the pressure off, then you'll, when you go to bed that night, you go, oh my God, what if I don't win? What if I don't win? I'll be playing with the pressure off and I don't win. So then when the pressure's on, how will I ever win when the pressure's on? The pressure will be three times higher when the pressure's on. So really, he's again putting himself under too much pressure. And I believe Rory will be under a lot of pressure tonight. Rory just can't hide his emotions, John. You see the way he... he the walk, he the bounce with. in the stride yesterday was fantastic. He, that's what we, yeah. we all Can you love. imagine playing poker with Rory McIlroy? <laughs> you just look at his face and you're going, he's got a pair of twos. His shoulders are just slumped. Or you look at him the next round, next hand, and it's like, I'm out, Rory. You've clearly got a full house. How would you know that? Because you were jumping around with your arms and your shoulders were bouncing up and down at the table. I mean, Rory just can't hide it. Um, I do think he's under a lot of pressure, John. No majors in seven years. He won four majors in three years. You tell me any other major, major top, 20, top seven history of golfers who between the ages of 23 and 31 won no majors. Name one, you can't. So, um, you know, it just doesn't happen. I mean, what kind of gap is that? To be absolutely at your prime. No car crashes, you know. He didn't walk away from the game. He's been playing solidly for the last eight years. Won no majors. Why? So he's putting much too much pressure on himself. And uh, in that intervening time, of course, the obvious has happened. Loads and loads and loads of players have won individual majors. You know, from your Brooks Kepkas to your Bryson DeChambeau's to your Justin Thomas's, Jason Day's, all of these players are now capable of winning majors. Whereas Rory could have been in a position to do what Tiger Woods did, which is basically shut people out and go, there's only about three of us capable of winning majors. Now, when you tee it up at the US Open, there's 17 players who feel they can win the major. John, I am enjoying the Euros. I'm enjoying it because um, I'm enjoying it because it, it's a bit of fun. It's great to see the crowds back. It's great to see a sense of the crowds back. It's great to see competitive games. It's great to be in that sort of luxurious embrace of what we know as a tournament. And what I mean by that is that idea that you can watch as much football as you like, but you know that tomorrow there's going to be more. So you can gorge on it and you can be greedy and you can go, oh, there's always Switzerland and Turkey tomorrow at three. And you can, it's really, it's kind of back and alien, isn't it? It's kind of a greed fest of football. However, for me, it does, uh, and you won't like to hear this, John, but <laughs> it does, it does emphasize for me even more the, the ultimate decline of football in, in my view. I mean, I grew up playing football. I played schoolboys football. I grew up loving football, um, but for a long time now, I've fallen out of love with football. And this Euros is no different. In fact, it's, it's, it's sent me more along the scale of falling out with football. football Why is that? For, for, well, for a variety of different reasons. Um, a bit like athletics, I don't trust football anymore. I don't believe it when I see it. FIFA, Qatar, Russia. Um, can, you not believe Messi, can you not believe Messi or can you not believe Ronaldo or these amazing players of the way the club game is or Manchester City how they play the game can you not believe that yeah I believe that they're real um, I just believe I don't believe that the whole superstructure of football is is genuine anymore um, first of all there's too much football so you know I remember being a kid and every four years the Euros would happen and every four years the World Cup would happen and you tune in because you knew that Football was going to be defined by that tournament. It was going to move forward during that tournament. It was going to show you things which were new during that tournament, which would define the next four-year cycle 
of football. Nowadays, that doesn't happen. The Champions League defines football unmistakably, unequivocally, unambiguously. The Champions League is the only game in town. I, w I wrote it down, actually, before I was going to talk to you, and I wrote down, in my view, the, f the Euros are fourth rate at this stage. There's the Champions League, there's the Indigenous Leagues, there's the World Cup, and then there's the Euros. Uh, that's the way I feel about it. It's too, also, the quality is mediocre. Uh, the games are fun, the quality is mediocre. Why not check out the Boyle Sports Betting app for the latest betting and stats on every player 